Hope this is live because I'm here and you're here. The 11th live stream guitar question and answer session with you and with me. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. In the chat, I put a few lyrics there. On with the show, this is it. What was that from? Who recognizes that? On with the show, this is it. Dan, you recognize what famous song <laughs> from many years ago? On with the show, this is it. Okay, or welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. I'm so glad you could attend. What song is that from? You guys know these songs, right? Uh, my friends, we are here to answer your questions. I can't wait. I have plenty to fill the time in between your questions. I have show and tell. I have uh, clarifications. I'm looking at my list. I have plenty to tell you about. So uh, we'll get down to it after I say a few hellos. Dan, welcome back. Scott recognizes Looney Tunes, the Looney Tunes theme song, right? Oh, what heights will hit <laughs> on with the show. This is it. David Belcher. Hello, David. Welcome back. Uh, so plenty to talk to you about, um, including some things uh, that I touched on previously and I want to get back to today or I want to clarify or whatever. So I'm looking at my list. That's where my eyes are going over here. Hear those? Hear those sirens? You guys are going to think that my my little Connecticut town here is a, uh, is a dangerous place. Not so much. Okay. Uh, so what I want to, uh, my agenda is over here. Like I said, that's my eyes are over here. There we go. So what I want to, sh <laughs> what I want to share with you amidst the sirens, uh, some of the things I'm going to touch on today, along with hopefully answering your guitar questions. Uh, I would like to share with you what I would do differently from day one when I brought home my first guitar, how I would practice and approach the guitar if I could go back in time, knowing what I know now. Uh, I want to talk about something called string stretching. A while back, I referred to stretching out the strings, specifically new strings. It's a crucial part of the string changing process, and I referred to it a while back, and I never, uh, I never got back to it. I just referred to it, never clarified, and talked about what string stretching is. We're going to talk about Lightning Hopkins today. I had a, uh, someone ask about Lightning Hopkins blues uh, style in a previous live shoot. So we're going to talk about Lightning Hopkins today. Last uh, week, someone mentioned, um, the, asked if I rec could recommend a certain scale book. And I said, any scale book is great, which is true, but I thought I could do a little bit better than that. So I grabbed a scale book that I use quite a bit. More sirens. Saturday night in a small town. Uh, so I grabbed one scale book, and after grabbing that scale book to show you guys, I thought of uh, a corresponding technique book. So I want to show you a pair of books today. Um, last week, somebody asked about bending strings. So I definitely want to get into bending strings a little bit. Uh, I have some show and tell. Uh, we're going to be talking about Bob Dylan a little bit in today's live stream. And so I have some Bob Dylan show and tell. And I have two Bob Dylan shows and tells. Uh, I want to talk about the, a couple of concepts. Students who are self-motivated, which is how I would describe you guys. If you're here on a Saturday, you are self-motivated. For some of you, it's a perfectly fine Saturday afternoon and you're choosing to be here. Some of you, it's a late Saturday night. Those of you over in the UK, uh, for example. And uh, so I want to um, talk about what it means to be self-motivated. Um, as an individual, but also as a teacher when I see students who are self-motivated, and a slight variation or, or another type of student I see, which is a student who I call at-risk. You know, I want to talk about an at-risk student. I also want to talk about Roy Clark and Gatemouth Brown. A while ago, I posted a video link uh, in the chat and a link to a terrific video with Roy Clark and Gatemouth Brown, and uh, I never talked about it. I posted the link. I never talked about it. So, uh, yeah. Oh, and one last thing, a special book sale. I'm always uh, giving you guys 15% off my book and eBooks at my website. I thought, let's just go for 20%. Let's just do it. And partly that's to ease my guilt for going on vacation on you guys. Next week I'm on vacation 
and uh, I feel guilty about taking it off of you guys. So 20%, I'm going to uh, I'll tell you how you can save 20% of my stuff. Okay, so a few more hellos here. Dashel, hello. Crotchety, old geezer, hello. Bruce, good to see you too. Uh, harmonica and guitar progress, I see your question. Welcome. So let's get right down to it. Harmonica and guitar progress asks. Oh, don't forget, folks, when you ask a question, do what harmonica and guitar progress did, which is put a couple of question marks in advance of your question. That's how I know you're aiming the question at me. Uh, harmonica and guitar progress asks, uh, sometimes my right hand thumb or index finger touches the strings. To what degree should you avoid this when picking or strumming? Index thumb or index finger. Now, harmonica and guitar progress. <laughs> um, you're talking about when you're holding a pick, right? You're holding a pick, but your thumb, and I'm reaching into my pocket to grab my, one of my picks. Okay. Uh, I can see how that would be irritating. If you're strumming and playing the guitar and having fun, and yet your skin is smacking against the strings, yeah, that could be get pretty irritating pretty fast. So if that's what you're talking about, I have a couple of ideas. You could use a bigger pick. So for example, don't use these little itty bitty, some people call these jazz picks, some people call them mandolin picks. Using a bigger pick um, could help uh, to just give you a little distance from, from the strings. <clears throat> um, most guitar teachers will tell you to hold the pick this way and potentially holding the pick this way could help with the problem. Long story short, you make a loose fist with your right hand, just a nice loose fist, okay? The pick goes under your thumb. Now, I realize this is not the ideal angle. <laughs> I know, I know. The pick, look at that. The pick goes under your thumb, pointing down towards the floor. Your thumb is doing all the work. I'm going to take away my thumb for a second. My index finger is just acting as a barrier. Notice my thumb is not extending way past. See how my thumb now is extending way past the end of the pick? Looks ridiculous, right? Don't do it. You can bend your knuckle a little bit. That, let's call that the first knuckle, the big knuckle uh, just past your fingernail cuticle. You can bend that knuckle a little bit on your thumb to make sure your thumb does not extend way past the edge of the pick. Anyways, holding the pick that way, maybe that, that could help um, because yeah, you don't, you don't want those, you don't want anything touching the string except the pick. Having said that, and I'll stand by that answer, having said that though, there are times when you want to create a certain type of harmonic sound where you do actually allow a little bit of your skin your, on your picking hand. You allow a little bit of your skin to, to touch the, um, a little bit of your skin to touch the string even as you're plucking that same string. And that can get a nice popping harmonic sound. That's more advanced and I don't think that's what you're asking about. So. Um, Anyways, I hope that helps. Larger pick, proper pick holding technique. By the way, if you want to get all snobby and judgmental, now that we have established this is essentially the right way to hold a pick, now you can get snobby and judgmental. You see people holding picks all sorts of goofy ways. And you will see very talented people holding picks all sorts of goofy ways. You can say they're not doing it right. Um, so bottom line, though, in general, what I'm showing you here is the conventionally, conventional proper way to hold a guitar pick, and you will see tons of talented people and beginners holding it differently. What are you going to do? You know, it, it comes with the territory. Uh, essentially, the guitar is a folk instrument in the sense that all sorts of folks play it, right? Everybody, you know, it's not something you can only play if you attend a conservatory and are, you know, go through an audition process. Anybody can play the guitar. Everybody does play the guitar. Um, with little or no training. So you see all sorts of stuff, including super talented people. That is not why they're talented. They are talented in spite of the fact that they may do things that don't make ergonomic sense, logical sense, um, but they've worked through it. Okay, uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Um, who have I not said hello to? Uh, um, harmonica and guitar progress. We'll get back to bending strings. Um, yep. Kermit the Frog, okay. Uh, Scott asked a, a terrific question. If we were to sneak a peek inside your guitar case, what would we find in there? 
that really depends on <laughs> which guitar it is and uh, and what my destination is with that particular guitar. Um, first of all, I only use hard shell guitar cases, and I'm aware that that's a commitment. Um, they're you know they're heavy, they're heavy. They you bump them against the wall and leave marks on your wall. Trust me, <laughs> uh, no. Um, they uh, they take up space. You can't fold them out of the way and tuck them into a little box like a gig bag. Um, so what I have in my guitar case, for sure, an extra set of strings, a, a bunch of more of these cute little Dunlop red one millimeter stubby picks, uh, clippers, my wire cutters, and a string winder for replacing strings and clipping off the excess strings, uh, a capo. For sure. This is now, this is assuming this is, I'm on my way to some place, right? Uh, uh, capo, for sure. <clears throat> um, depending on the gig, I might have a stack of papers or a few papers, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheets with whatever I need to get me through that gig. Lyrics, a set list, uh, or lyrics in a set list, list from the last time I, <laughs> I did something. Um, uh, so it's pretty practical stuff. I don't have anything to... Uh, unnecessary in there. Um, guitar strap, I was going to have a strap folded up, uh, having a strap available. Let's see. Okay, what are some things I don't put in a case? Uh, I don't have any like folded up towels or anything there to protect the guitar. You know, these are cases that easily cost me 100, 150 bucks, or they came with the guitar, you know, making the guitar that much more expensive. So these are cases that shouldn't need any extra padding or foam or towels or anything like that. Oh, I'll often have a, um, a little cotton cloth, some, some sort of cloth for wiping off the strings. Um, strings can, can get rusty quick or you know, oxidized um, depending on the, the pH of the oils in your fingers. So I'm just, even though that doesn't happen to me, it's not a problem I suffer from, uh, but I do usually have some sort of uh, cloth that um, I wipe off the strings every time I finish playing because it can't hurt. Um, some of you, hopefully not many, I see 30 people. Whoa, 30 people, we've only been doing this for 10 minutes. Uh, some of the 30 folks amongst you, you might have this issue where you play a guitar and, and the next day, the strings have this crusty feeling on them. And that's, you're just blessed with a certain acidity, I guess, in, in the oil on your hands. Um, so you folks especially need to wipe them off. Okay, so I guess that about covers it in my guitar cases. Um, <laughs> I try not to you know, keep any snacks or anything edible in there. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I'm not a fan of gig bags, although I, I keep hearing the, um, the advantages of gig bags. And there's plenty. Uh, and there's one disadvantage. They don't protect the guitar as well. <laughs> you know, they just don't. And, and, oh. Um, I, I'm likely to have some sort of guitar humidifying device, um, especially if it's an acoustic guitar case. Those, there's lots of great uh, guitar humidifying devices, and those are rendered useless if it's in a gig bag, because gig bags breathe and they let all the humidity out. And so here where I live in uh, Connecticut, uh, come you know later in the fall and well into the very early spring, the, the uh, humidity drops so much, and we all crank up our heat um, so humidifying, especially acoustic instruments, makes a lot of sense. And there's no way you can keep a guitar humidified in a gig bag. So I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm going against the grain here. I'm not a fan of gig bags, um, although I'm aware of a million, you know, advantages to using a gig bag. But I, I'm, I'm stuck on those two things. They don't protect the guitar as well. So what's the point? <laughs> uh, in fact, they may not protect the guitar at all, depending on how flimsy the gig bag is. And secondly, when it's that time of year where we all should be humidifying our inst uh, instruments, depending on where you live, um, they, don't, they don't help with that. Um, but yes, I'm aware, number one, gig bags uh, have a lot of advantages, I get it. And number two, um, sometimes you don't have a choice, you buy a guitar and that's what comes with the guitar. So if you were to, to get a hard shell case for your instrument, you would have to actually go to the trouble of shopping around and making sure you get the right size, it becomes a whole project, I get it. Um, but that's my answer to question. Nothing too, uh, nothing too dramatic in there, Scott. Although I try to have whatever would help me get me through a gig, you know. Uh, harmonic and guitar progress. I hear you mentioning a chipboard case. Yeah, 
they kind of chipboard case kind of splits the difference. It potentially could keep humidity in. When I say chipboard, um, it's almost like a glorified cardboard, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's a cardboard type material, usually covered in black vinyl. Um, uh, potentially could keep the humidity in the case and it, and it has rigid corners basically, so it could protect a little bit better. Um, I don't know, you know, then again, if you're hanging out at home and your guitar is on a music stand, a guitar stand, you don't need a case at all, right? And if you live in a part of the country where the humidity does not drop dramatically in cold weather, don't listen to me, you know. Okay, let's see who else is here. Uh, hey, Bob Nation, hi. I just saw you yesterday, Bob Nation, welcome back. Um, Russ, you're asking about straps um, in hard cases. I'll fold up my strap. I won't, when I put a guitar in a case, I don't leave it, I don't leave the strap on. I'll remove the strap, fold it up nicely, a little OCD going on there. I'll, you know, make it nice and equal. And I'll tuck it under, I'll quickly tuck it right under here. Not under the headstock, but but right under here. There's, usually, there's a little void there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll keep in the guitar case for old time's sake, I'll keep uh, a copy of the receipt. This reminds me what I paid for the guitar. Any warranty information, I might keep that in there. Um, you know, I try, this is a whole nother can of worms, um, documenting that you own an instrument, right? So if you're really on the ball, you make a photocopy of stuff like that, especially if you spent, you know, a few hundred, a thousand bucks for your guitar, you want to you want to have that on your, you know, homeowner's uh, policy or something, you know. So, yeah, you know, you might want to make a photocopy of your receipt. Uh, you might, you know, document your warranty information, whatever the case might be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, harmonic and guitar progress are saying, don't put the strap in the case while on the guitar. It could leave a mark. Yeah, it could. It could, you know. Um, uh depending on, you know, some synthetic material or even leather. I mean, anything is possible, especially when, when heat comes into play. I can imagine even a, a nice leather strap, if the guitar gets so hot, I can imagine some chemical reaction happening that could potentially discolor your guitar. Um, then again, if your guitar is getting so hot that whatever strap is involved is having a chemical reaction, you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> That's not the only problem your guitar is going to have. Although it could potentially add to the problems of guitars. Uh, my friends, treat your guitar like a puppy. No extremes of hot or cold, you know, like a puppy. You wouldn't leave your puppy in the trunk of your car on a cold day while you go shopping for a few hours, right? Just treat like a puppy or a kitten or a plant. You know, it's a treat it like a living thing. You know, no extremes of hot or cold. You heard it here first. Okay, looking for some more questions, my friends. Otherwise, I am going to just head on down my agenda. Crotchy the old geezer says, I live in the desert. What should I be using? <clears throat> well, uh, the you know, presumably you have extremely dry, um, warm weather. Uh, which means you are cranking up the AC all the time. So yeah, so you're going to want to watch your humidity. I'm sure someone amongst you knows the the target humidity is at 45% humidity in a perfect world. We'd keep all our guitars, but especially our acoustic guitars in a controlled environment of about 45% humidity. I think that's the ballpark number. Um, so if you've got the AC cranked up, crotchety old geezer and... Uh, and the humidity is well below 45%, um, especially with acoustic guitar. There are so many devices, so many um, humidifying devices. I don't have any one particular one that I recommend because they're all, any humidifying device is better than nothing. Many of them somehow address or send the humidity down into the guitar, whether it's a, a, a tiny, like a little garden hose, looks like a little piece of garden hose that hangs down in there or a circular um, shape that actually almost clips into the uh, into the uh, sound hole and closes off the sound hole, so it sends the humidity into the guitar, but doesn't let it out again. Those are pretty cool. I think Kaiser um, makes that type of humidifying device. K Y S E R Kaiser. Any humidifying device um, 
is better than nothing. And uh, the only folks who don't have to think about this is folks who live in constant high humidity. Um, and you know who you are. Uh, then you might have other issues, you know. Um, and those of you who play only electric guitar, you're kind of spared this drama to some extent. Um, it's, it's still worth keeping in mind. Um, we all have fingerboards on our guitars and fingerboards dry out over time naturally, they just do. And what you know your fingerboard is getting dry when you gently run your fingers along the outside of your neck and you can feel the fret ends poking into your fingers. Um, that's a sign that the fingerboard has shrunk in towards the middle. But the frets, of course, don't shrink because no matter how dry the temperature, the humidity, you know, how little humidity you have, metal is not going to shrink due to low humidity. Wood does shrink because of low humidity. I'm talking about the fret one, not the neck. But anyways, if you run your fingers like this and you can feel those fret ends poking into your skin, yeah, then two things. Either either your, your instrument has, you know, the, the fretboard is shrinking or the fret ends were never filed the way they should be from, from the factory, which is, that's, it's possible. In fact, we, there's a, a tip when you're shopping for a new guitar, especially, or any guitar, but especially a new guitar, you should not feel the fret ends against your skin when you run your fingers along, you know, the, the neck on either side of the neck. Um, in a perfect world, say you found your dream guitar and everything about it is great, except you feel those frets, but you, you should say to the store, hey, this guitar is great, but I'm not going to buy it, and no one should buy it until you do a nice little fret work there. As soon as you do that, I'll, I'll you know, I'll buy this guitar. Um, because if the retailer does not do that, you're going to be paying someone else to do that. And why should you pay someone else to do that? Or put it this way, the retailer could say, oh, our, our repair person won't get to that for a month, but how would if we knock off X percent or take off whatever of the price that's okay, that's cool. But you're gonna end up taking that money and bring it to your preferred repair person to have them smooth it out. Okay, uh, moving on, let's talk about, um, let's see, looking for those question marks. Audio file man, welcome back. Uh, mm -hmm. Audio file man, if, if, if you could have like a, a house or even a room humidifier, again, in order to establish that 40, 45%, Many of you have probably walked into either a guitar center or or mom and pop kind of store, maybe a, on the higher end, you know, a place that sells the, the top quality stuff. And they have an acoustic room, right, with a slider, a big thick glass door. So, you know, they're, they're trying to maintain a consistent humidity in there. Um, and the, the, yeah, I wish that for all of us. It's, it's tough um, to maintain the ideal humidity throughout your whole house. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one, but, but to, to do the best you can in one room, I'll say it again, though, the ideal, because this is within all of our control, um, a humidifying device that enters the sound hole, whatever style, you know, something that involves a sound hole, the instrument, then you put your instrument in a hard shell case and close the case that, you know, maintains the humidity right in, uh, then you go and play the guitar, you have fun, you, and when you're done, you put it back in the case. And you do that all winter long, because <laughs> um, we control that, right? Um, that's, yeah, I recommend. Uh, another example of what happens if you don't humidify a guitar, then I'm, these are especially, I bring this up because this can really affect older guitars that have lost a lot of their moisture anyways, but even with new guitars, you will see humidity cracks. Um, a crack, say, right along a seam, or a crack along the grain. Um, and you'll know that because it's, you'll think, I didn't, why is that cracked? I didn't drop my guitar. Nobody sat on my guitar. And it's, it's a humidity crack. It can be repaired, but you have better things to do with your money. Um, and, uh, and yeah. And then you have to, then you're going to have to hear the same lecture from some uh, luthier or, or guitar repair person who's going to say, hey, man, you know, you really should think about humidifying your guitar, blah, blah, blah. And you'll say, uh, I heard that YouTube guy say the same thing. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to head over to my agenda here. And I, oh, let, let's uh, get down to business, saving you guys some money. I'm putting in the chat the coupon code to save 20% 
There's the coupon code. And where do you go to buy some cool guitar books and save 20% on e-books that you download or even a real book that you can hold in your hands without printing out like this. There's my website. Okay, 20%. And because I'm doing this as a way of saying thank you and a little bit of guilt uh, because I'm going to be gone next Saturday. No live stream next Saturday, my friends. Um, uh, this uh, sale, I know some of you are watching this on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. This sale is for a solid week. Okay, so even those of you who are watching the recorded version of this live stream, you too can save uh, 20%. So head on over to www.song-bike.com. The coupon code is live stream 20 live stream all one word two zero all one phrase. Okay. Um, so let's talk about let me do a little show and tell. Okay, I am heading off to Maine for a week and I got myself a, a book. And I've been trying so hard successfully to not read this book ahead of time. And here's my show and tell. I, uh, I sprung for the hardcover copy of this book. The book is called Pledging My Time. Pledging My Time, Converse, Conversations with Bob Dylan Band Members, written by Ray Paget. Thank you, Ray. Uh, what a cool book. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Uh, so um, I, I'm already recommending it to you. Uh, but I haven't read it yet because I've been saving it for vacation. You can get a hardcover, you can get a paperback. I believe Amazon only has the paperback. Uh, I follow Ray Paget on social media, and he mentioned that he doesn't really make a whole lot of money when we all go to Amazon and buy the paperback, but he actually makes a little bit of money if you pony up for the hardcover. So I decided to go and buy the hardcover to give him a few extra bucks because this is a book I never thought would be written. I assume, you know, Bob Dylan's a private guy, and I assume the musicians who play with him, you know, are are not are discouraged from, you know, talking out of school, so to speak. Um, and but apparently, there's lots to read in this book. Hundreds of pages, folks. Almost four over four hundred pages. Interviews with lots and lots of people who played as part of Bob Dylan's band at one point of his career or another. So that's one of my show and tells. This is what I'm going to be doing in the state of Maine uh, all this coming week. And I'm just so excited about that. So Pledging My Time is the name of the book. And uh, Ray Paget, P-A-D-G-E-T-T. -T. And just so you know, I got this, if you want the hardcover, because why not? It wasn't cheap. But, you know, just to know that the money, a, a lot of the money goes right to the author as opposed to Amazon, I, I decided to pony up and, and pay the extra bucks. Uh, to get the hardcover, I don't think you can get it from Amazon, but lulu.com, I'll put that in the chat. Um, www.lulu, just spelled exactly how you think it would be spelled. Okay. I believe Lulu is one of those places that does a print on demand. So when you order, they print you your copy of your book and then send it to you. Um, and the name of the book, I'll put this in the chat too. Pledging. I know we got a few Bob Dylan fans out there. Pledging my time by Bob. I almost said Bob Dylan by Ray Paget. So I know it had to be a labor of love. And uh, the least I can do is give him a plug and. Uh, and support. Okay, <clears throat> speaking of Bob Dylan, uh, another bit of um, uh, show and tell. Way back when, and I've already forgotten, was it this past February, January, or February? Um, I was a guest uh, on a Bob Dylan podcast. I'm going to put the link to the podcast in the chat in a minute. Uh, it's a terrific podcast called Pod Dylan, P O D Dylan, Pod Dylan, with a freewheeling Rob Kelly. And he has embarked on this terrific podcast where every episode focuses on one Bob Dylan song. And I was a fan of the podcast. And um, after listening to a whole bunch of episodes, I thought, geez, you know, I would love to be a guest on this. And um, I got in touch and we spoke and he said, okay, we I picked a song. So um, for those of you who are real Bob Dylan uh, aficionados, 
the song I pick, I, I picked a bunch of songs and Rob sort of chose one from my list uh, from the Planet Waves album recorded with the band, the band called The Band, uh, Bob Dylan's first and only album with Geffen Records, uh, the band, the uh, album called Planet Waves and the song called Going, Going, Gone. So if you want to uh, hear me um, talking in a different context with a very intelligent host, um, we talk for, I think, about an hour, uh, not just about that one song, although, yeah, a lot of it is that one song, but I tried um, to put the song in a context, not only in terms of Bob Dylan's career, but also uh, the, the times, you know, 1973, 1974, what was going on in the world. Um, and I, it was so much fun. I did a little deep dive into uh, American culture, and um, try to work a little bit of that in. Um, but I also got into some of the specifics as to why going, going, gone uh, means a lot to me in terms of like why I enjoy the actual song and the recording of the song too. So I'm gonna put that link in the chat right now. Here we go. And this is on your end, this is gonna look like Fire and Water Podcast. Bear with me, folks. Here it comes. Okay. So the Fire and Water podcast is what the link is going to like, look like in your chat. <clears throat> and it's me and the freewheeling Rob Kelly talking for quite a bit about the song Going, Going, Gone by Bob Dylan. And I recommend uh, his whole podcast which is called, I put this in the chat too. His podcast is called Pod Dylan. I never listened to podcasts before. <laughs> and then my family moved from one town to another town. And all of a sudden I had a, a short commute, <laughs> you know, 25 minutes or so. And um, I never had a commute before. I could get to from my house to the music shop here about five minutes. And, uh, and I started listening to podcasts. And man, there's some bad podcasts, but then you find a good one and then you want to listen to every single episode. Uh, so, okay, thank you for um, here my Bob Dylan show and tell. I hope you enjoy the episode where I was the guest, but um, if you're a Bob Dylan fan, I think you're going to like all those episodes. Okay, thank you, everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, look back here at the chat, looking for those question marks. And believe me, I have plenty to talk about if you guys are talking amongst yourselves. Hey, Beginner Guitar Lessons, John is our moderator. That's why uh, Beginner Guitar Lessons is in that bright blue with a wrench. Um, so he is our moderator, and uh, he uh, will keep everything flowing smoothly with love in our hearts. Um, Scott Rhodes enjoyed the Bob Dylan book, Philosophy of Modern Song. And... Uh, and you know what? I, I actually haven't read that book. Um, it's on my list. <laughs> I know it's been out for a while. North Country Fisher, welcome. Okay, so uh, let's talk about Lightning Hopkins. Um, last uh, live stream, um, his name came up, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who, but someone said, is Lightning Hopkins guitar style easy to learn? Something along those lines. Um, and I answered that Emulating anyone's style is tricky because of, of how, um, how many idiosyncrasies um, pop up. But by definition, someone's style, it's someone who's doing something that makes sense to them, is comfortable to them, something that they've potentially worked at. And the rest of us, me, you, all of us, um, can find ourselves challenged to a 100% walk in the footsteps. But um, I, I said, and I thought to myself as well, you know, I, I don't, I'd have to do a little bit of a research into, into exactly what Lightning Hopkins style is. And I knew I had some learning material. So way back when uh, I got myself a copy of this book and the name of the book is Texas Blues uh, by Stefan Grossman. Um, back in the day, this was published by Oak Publications. Uh, the Oak Anthology of Blues Guitar, that's sort of the subtitle, but I think the official title is Texas Blues by Stefan, S-T-E-F-A-N, Grossman. Many of you recognize that name. Stephen Grossman uh, was a real student of the blues guitar players 
that he was um, meeting and traveling with and exposed to in the 60s. He was really a student of many blues guitar players and he documented what he found and the rest of us benefit from that because he read these books. Uh, so Stefan Grossman, some of you may have some Stefan Grossman books, mainly blues books, if not completely blues books, but uh, interesting guy and interesting books. Okay, so Lightning Hopkins has a section here. So because I didn't want to, because I want to give you guys a more complete answer to the question, I went through, there's, there's about three Lightning Hopkins songs in here. <clears throat> and uh, I want to give you guys a little bit of a taste of what I found um, when I try to answer the question, is his style um, easy to play? It's not, it's, it's, let me start by saying his style from the, um, the, the first thing I noticed is, and I kind of knew this going in, but it's a one man band style, meaning he is accompanying himself. He is doing certain things with his thumb and separate but related things with his individual fingers. Um, so he's making a complete sound. And you might say, well, don't we all do that? No, we don't. Um, when you think of say B.B. King getting up in front of his band and playing a guitar solo, he is not making a complete sound. The band is, is making the complete sound along with him. They're, they're you know, they are the canvas that he's putting paint on top of. Um, so the first thing that I realized very quickly when I look back, oh, it's so funny, on the Lightning Hopkins pages, by the way, I made notes to myself about, you know, lots of little notes, you know? So I just had forgotten that because it's probably been a few years since I did that, but it's funny looking back at my handwriting and I think I found a typo somewhere and some r reminders to myself which finger to use on my left hand or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing I notice, like I said, he's, he's got his thumb going. He's got. He's got his fingertips typically on the treble strings, you know, adding in melodic sounds. So see what I mean by a complete sound? He's got this accompaniment going. Now I'm, I'm speaking super generally here, okay? If any of the 39 amongst you have gone to school on Lightning Hopkins. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking super generally here and, and you know, I'm not getting into nitty gritty. But see, for, for the rest of us, <laughs> see what I mean about that complete sound? It's like my thumb is both the drummer and the bass player, right? And I happen to be using my index and ring, uh, index and middle on the two treble strings. For the record, I'm hitting the open A, the open fifth string of my thumb, and I play a nice little bluesy complement to the open A string. Second string, fifth fret with my ring finger. First string, third fret with my left hand index finger. You put those two together, my right hand index and middle, I'm plucking those two strings. A to Z, B, yes, I'm in standard tuning, yeah. By itself, it, that sounds a little empty, right? That I'm just doing the treble string. See how that sounds? I mean, it's nice, right? But when my thumb jumps in there, listen to the effect. So just to use B.B. King as an example, this is not how B.B. King plays the guitar. I mean, I'm sure he could, um, but he doesn't need to keep that steady sound going because he's got a whole band keeping that steady sound going. I was lucky enough to see B.B. King in Chicago. He was playing at a, a, a bar, basically. I mean, a big place, but a glorified bar um, called the Cubby Bear. And he was doing two shows, like a, a 7.30 and a 10 o'clock show. And I, went, I got tickets, went to the 7.30 show, great. Um, and I, I left and I became aware that there were tickets available for the 10 o'clock show. I just bought another ticket, walked right back in because holy cow, man, to see B.B. King like for, you know, two shows right there. I mean, 
Who would not do that, right? Why not? I'm glad I did. Okay. Uh, so here's another thing I found. And that I'm basing this on three transcriptions in that book that Stephen Grossman did. Um, but I feel comfortable generalizing like this. Lighten Hopkins does not keep a steady beat with his thumb, not constantly. So he'll he'll get going. then he'll get into some melodic stuff and stop doing the thumb altogether. Why? Because he can. Why not, you know? Um, so th that's that's a little, little um, that's something that is, I would certainly say, is part of his style. And uh, that makes it, even though it might seem like less work, like, oh, you don't have to do your thumb so much. Yeah, but there's something about being able to rely on that thumb as a constant, um, is to say, if we're imitating someone else's playing style, that can become a very nice, um, consistent reminder of where the beat is, you know, and the melody can fit around that beat. Um, so interestingly, he does not do that, and uh, that's his right, you know. So he'll get into some melodic stuff and then come back to that thumb. So, okay. To conclude, Audio Power Man says, Lightning Hopkins is how I want to play the blues, yeah. I mean, why not? And I can see one reason why, because you don't need a band, you know, you, you are the band. Now, I believe Lennon Hopkins did record with ensembles with, you know, they weren't all solo recordings, um, but, but he could accompany himself, basically. And he was not the first nor the last to do that. But, but if someone says to me, what's Lightning Hopkins style, based on my little research just then, and doing some listening, that's one thing I've noticed. He's that kind of player. He's the kind of player who accompanies himself. Uh, so let's see. Of course, he's singing as well. And right there, that's huge. If you're singing and playing at the same time, you're going to make decisions based on what you just sang. You're going to potentially not play as much, be less busy, so to speak. They call that being busy. You know, do lots of busy stuff when you're when you're not singing. But then, as soon as you are singing, maybe you know, go back to the the more sparse kind of playing because you're you're singing, you're doing that. But then you stop singing, and you can throw in the blues riffs and stuff. Okay, long story short, would I say Lightning Hopkins style is is easy? Or would I say it's a good introduction to the blues? I, I would hesitate to say anything's easy. Um, I would say anybody can can begin to do his style, can begin to do his things, you know, to, to start walking on in his footsteps. Um, yes, and it's, and it's a good introduction. And yet, it's not um, formulaic exactly. So not formulaic in a... In a um, in the ideal sense for students. So you so you really are walking in, in his footsteps. And if he does something, it is not for us to ask why. It's it's for us to follow his footsteps. You know, okay, he's not playing his thumb right there. Okay, and he's he's doing this melodic thing right there. Okay, well, let's do it. Um, to give you an example of someone, um, Mississippi John Hurt comes to mind as a guy who in general um, He is keeping this steady thumb. Hear that? He is keeping that thumb going. And any melodic notes, all melodic notes, are either exactly at the exact same time as a thumb. I'm talking about my right hand index, my right hand middle, either joining exactly with a thumb, or they were, what I would call a pinch, or exactly in between the thumbs. Oops, and the thumb is alternating back and forth. I'm on a G major chord here, and my thumb is alternating between the fat six string and the open fourth string six, four. Oops. See how you can tap your foot? There's no doubt about where the beat is. 
that's Mississippi John Hurt style, you know. In some ways, that's easier because you can count on that thump every time. Um, I guess my final word would be what Lighten Hopkins is doing is a little more um, abstract, you know, and what Mississippi John Hurt is, is doing is like he, he's the drummer, man. Boom, chick, boom, ding, dum, ding, dum, ding. You can count on that. Um, Susan says, what chord is that? You can't see it. Um, well, just then, I was doing a G major chord um, with my ring and middle, ring finger, sixth string, third fret, middle finger, fifth string, the A string, second fret, and then my pinky is dancing all around. Um, that happens to be essentially a one chord John Hurt song called Take This Hammer. What's the name of that tune? Take This Hammer, the John, it's like a, the John Henry, you know, uh, theme. Take this hammer and bring it to the camp. Not John Henry, but um, I have to stop and think about what the name of that tune is. <laughs> okay, so thanks for hearing me out there. That's how I would compare Lightning Hopkins style to, to another you know, essentially an acoustic blues style. I believe Lightning Hopkins played electric guitar at times too, but nevertheless, it's a one man band kind of style. Um, and that's how I would compare him to someone else who did a one man band kind of style. Okay, Bill R says he's been to the Cubby Bear. He saw classic musicians there like Yorma Kaukonen. Uh, hey, Michael, hello from Macon, Georgia. Stacy, you're not so late, Stacy. It's, ah, uh, you're doing fine, you're doing fine. Um, North County Fisher says, Mississippi John Hurt is amazing at using his thumb and finger simultaneously, and he goes fast. Yeah, I'll say this about John Hurt. Um, his tunes sound just fine at a slower speed. I'm talking about for you and me, just to, to work hard on a, on a John Hurt, Mississippi John Hurt tune, and uh, <clears throat> and get it and feel confident, like know you're playing it, but it's a slower speed. That's all right. It's, it sounds so, it sound, to, the, to the world, it sounds so good. To a John Hurt fan, um, they might say, "Wow, you're not playing it as fast as he does." Yeah, that's that's not always the you know the only. It's not always the goal, man. Um, his but bottom line is his songs, his approach sounds great at a slower slower speed. Not everything does. Some things you really have to play it at the correct speed to sound great. Not not that one. Um, hey, Lil Dina one. Um, Lil Dina one says. In that video you made, the classic blues riff video, yep, you taught a small part of a scale, oh yeah, okay, to answer that blues call. Look at you, little Dina, you, you've done your homework, you got a good question. Yeah, man, okay, let's talk about that. Uh, one of the absolute most satisfying things uh, I use as a teacher, and I assume other guitar teachers do this too, but I don't know, I don't know. I, I'm self-taught as a guitar teacher. I didn't go to the guitar teacher school. Uh, so... I'll show you what the call is, and which little Dean, I know you know what it is, but I'll, I'll, I'm gonna illustrate that for all of us, and then I'll address this whole response thing. Okay, so good old. Right, good old Muddy Waters. Now don't call it bad to the bone, even though it sounds like bad to the bone, but you know, George Thorogood, he knows, we all know, he did not invent that riff. The Muddy Waters blues riff. Okay, so uh, real quick, and I, by the way, when I timestamp this video, which could be a few days because I'm going to be on vacation, it might be a while before I timestamp this one, but when I do, I will include the tab for what I just played. But bottom line is, I am using a pick. You can do this with any two bare fingers, though. The third and fourth strings, the two center strings, I'm going to play them both as open strings simultaneously. I'm doing two strings simultaneously. Okay, the third and fourth open strings. Okay. I'm going to stay on those same two strings. I'm going to squeeze at the fifth fret, same two strings. Okay, so far we have two open strings, same two strings at the fifth fret. Continuing on, same two strings open again, same two strings at the third fret, same two strings open. So, so far we have 
zero five zero three zero. Okay, nothing wrong with doing this with your bare fingers, but don't give up on doing it with a pick. You get a louder, clearer sound with a pick. You just have to develop the right touch so that you only strum two strings and not any more strings. Okay, now to finish off this riff, we'll get to the scale in a minute, but to finish off the riff, uh, your fat E string, third fret, and the rhythm, I call it the heartbeat, heartbeat rhythm. One string, which is the fat string, third fret, heartbeat, heartbeat. You put that together with the first part. Okay. So that's a complete musical statement. Makes for a great jam session. Anybody can play that with a tiny bit of practice. It sounds great. Now, what Lodina is referring to is the video I made way back when, 2013, give or take. Um, I think I just called the classic blues riff, something like that. Um, uh, I mentioned that there's a couple of situations where you can expand upon that. One situation is you have a friend and the friend is playing that over and over again. Okay, and you are answering back, which I'll talk about in a second. Or the other situation is you're doing both parts. You're doing this. But instead of doing the heartbeat, heartbeat, you're answering back with a little improvised or not so improvised little blues riff based on a blues scale. So it could sound like this. Right? So you're doing both parts. It sounds great. Okay. So either way, what you need to know is the G blues scale. Why do you need to know the G blues scale? Because this riff is in the key of G. Take my word for it. Um, I wouldn't expect you to just know that. That's okay. Um, although I will say, check this out. When you, if you did go over to the fat string third fret, that's the note G. So it's not a coincidence that we're sort of coming to rest on that G note. Okay, bottom line, a G blues scale. You ready? I'm gonna, there's lots of ways to play any scale up and down the neck. Let's do it the easy way, right? Why make it harder for ourselves? The G blues scale is exactly what you need as a source of notes to improvise with if you or someone else is doing the, this Muddy Waters riff. Okay, you ready? And again, I'll put this in the description of this video when I timestamp it, but that could be a few days. <laughs> Probably be a week easily. Um, but, okay, you ready? Third skinny string, open. Third skinny string, third fret, use your ring finger. Trust me, you wanna use your ring finger. Moving on, second skinny string, your B string. First fret, index finger. Second fret, middle finger. Third fret, ring finger. That was all on your B string. And lastly, on your skinny E string, first fret, index finger, and third fret, ring finger. Don't worry, I'll go over it. But you guys are smart, you're getting this. Third string, zero, three. When I say zero, that means open string, right? Second string, one, two, three. First string, one, three. Absolutely practice it backwards. Aside from just practicing to go faster, you want to go faster, down, up, picking with your right hand, you'll never regret it, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, I could never play it that fast if I wasn't consistently plucking down, then up, then down, then up, then with no exceptions. I'm never doing two downs in a row, never doing two ups in a row, okay? Okay, so last thing, and then we'll move on here. Last thing, uh, that's uh, what, seven, six notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven notes all together, okay. 
that's your source of notes. When you or someone else goes and you want to put a little response in there, by the way, the easiest response, the rhythm, just do another response of heartbeat, heartbeat, but choose notes from the scale. So I'm going to go first skinny string, first fret, third fret, first fret, third fret. So it's like heartbeat, heartbeat. Okay, again, first fret, first string, first fret, third string. I'm going to do it again. First fret, first string, first fret, third string. Now I'm going to do it with that feeling of heartbeat, heartbeat. Now I'm going to put it as the response to the call. Here's the call. Okay. Now I chose a relatively easy combination, right? First fret, third fret, first fret, third fret. But you can choose any of those notes from the G blues scale, and they're all going to sound good. Although you'll develop certain little phrases that you like the best. My advice is that stick with that heartbeat, heartbeat rhythm, because that gives you structure. No need to go too crazy. You, you'll lose that. People won't be able to tap their foot to what you're doing. I'll, here's, I'll, I'll give you an idea of what I mean. You start off with a nice toe tapper. And now imagine if I went. I mean, yeah, that's nice, but where, where did the beat just go? See how it works, that heartbeat, heartbeat rhythm, it just works. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Lil Dina. Love it. Um, Susan was saying, what quarters are you using in the Lightning Hopkins segment? Excellent question. It wasn't even a, an actual chord exactly. Um, index finger, first skinny string, third fret. Trust me, you want that to be your index finger. Ring finger, or your pinky, I'm gonna use my ring finger, second string, third fret, uh, yeah, second string, fifth fret. <laughs> index finger, first string, third fret, ring finger or pinky, second string, fifth fret. We wanna make sure both of those, before we even get down to business, you wanna make sure both of those are ringing clearly. Yeah, and then, because I was in light in Hopkins mode, I was using bare, bare hand. <clears throat> There's my open A with my thumb, open fifth string. And then I, I always use my index and middle on those two treble strings. Now what I'm doing is not easy. It's not, <laughs> it's not um, the idea of half of your brain being the drummer slash bass player and the other half of your brain having a little party over here. You know, and the reason I'm making a big deal of saying it's not easy, because I'm sure of the 41, woohoo, 41 people out there, not all 41 of you are like, dude, you know, I do that in my sleep. I do it all day long. It's weird. It's a weird thing. Um, don't forget, all my training was as a drummer. So even though I found this challenging, for sure, as a young guy doing stuff like this, I got the concept. Because this is exactly what drummers live and breathe with. Um, keeping something consistent and adding on something else. But even what you're adding on is not... Those sirens. Even what you're adding on is not unrelated, it's not random, but it is independent in its own way. Now imagine changing, doing different left hand stuff, imagine singing, yeah, and, and now you're, you're closer and closer to walking in, like in Hopkins, footsteps, okay. And North Country Fisher says, are we having a quick circle of fifths lesson this week? Well, I have my circle of fifths and I intend to. And somehow we're already an hour into this live stream. Um, but yes, I intend to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Audio Fowl Man says, my classic blues riff is the first blues riff I learned. Good. Good. Yeah, man. It should be. It's so easy, right? It's so easy. Yeah. It's, it's valuable. Uh, 
Paul Mannion says, uh, hi, Jonathan, Mark Knopfler has a great YouTube video playing the blues. Um, it can be a little overwhelming to watch the masters play. Oh yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. But you know, when in doubt, um, you know, watch folks for inspiration. Um, music happens so fast by, by definition, it flows so smoothly and so quickly. You, you are, you're not the only one who watches terrific guitar players. And some of them aren't even famous, but they're just terrific guitar players. And, and you're not the only one who watches that and says, okay, I don't know what just happened. I know I like it, but I don't know what just happened. Yeah, that's, and my prediction is someone's gonna watch you at some point and say the same thing. It could be someone who has zero experience playing the guitar, but nevertheless, you're gonna have that experience. Uh, you're gonna give that experience to someone else who says, man, I'm watching so-and-so, I'm watching my buddy, I'm watching Scott Rose, I'm watching A to Z me, I'm watching Paul Mannion, uh, but I can't quite figure out what they're doing. Um, yeah, because it happens too fast and it's too subtle. Uh, so, but, so you watch for inspiration, you know, you do, um, unless you're watching a very explicit lesson, in which case the person should be playing it slower, slower, slower. Um, Leontina asks a good question, is there more of the G scale on the E and A strings? Oh yeah. Yeah, um, and let, let's talk about that just to complete it. But the reason why I'm sticking with the three treble strings, first of all, to keep things simple um, uh, and clear. Second of all, to get a contrasting sound. I'm, I'm back with my pick here, back with that classic blues riff. Relatively mid to low frequencies here. Right? And the contrasting, you know, higher sounds. So that's why. I'm sticking with the G blues scale just then on the three treble strings. <clears throat> but yeah, to, to you might you might as well get all the all the all the strings involved. So I'm gonna teach you the G blues scale. It's not this is not the only G blues scale, this is the G blues scale down in our comfort zone, right? The first few frets. Nothing wrong with staying in your comfort zone. This, you can make so much good music in the first four frets of the guitar. You can spend a lifetime doing beautiful things. Um, now I don't want you to be limited down there but oh yeah you can make a lot of great music and never get past the fifth fret sure okay so i'm going to start in the skinny treble e string this is the g blue scale descending i'm going to say this slowly um grab a pencil you don't have it already okay first string third fret first string first fret second string three two one Third string, three, zero. That's our first octave. We have from a high G. Okay, now let's do our second octave. I'm gonna start that third string open. G string open. Fourth string, third fret. Fourth string open. It's an open D. Fifth string. Let me make sure I say this right. Okay, fifth string, I'm back. Fifth string, fourth fret. Finally, the pinky gets to do something. Definitely use your pinky on the fifth string, fourth fret. Don't whip out. Give your pinky some work. That's the fifth string, fourth fret. Fifth string, third fret in uh, ring finger. Fifth string, first fret, index. Sixth string, third fret. You've made it back home to the G note, also known as the root note in this context. Oops. Bonus note, six string first fret. That's a note F. And if that sounds a little bit unresolved to you, it should. It's not the root note. And if that bugs you, that unresolved sound, that tension, then come on back to that six string third fret. And you're back, ha, huh? you're back on your root note. Okay, so that's the G blues scale, uh, two octaves, um, six strings. So yes, all of that is fair game. When someone is keeping that going, oh yeah. Ooh, ooh record yourself, record yourself doing the Buddy Waters blues riff. And then solo on top of it, as to your heart's, heart's content. Hey, Bill R., thank you for the super chat, which reminds me, super chats. Um, 
If you are so inclined to support the cause, take a look at the bottom of the chat. You see that dollar sign, that little um, box. And you click on that and, uh, and uh, I, I appreciate it. I thank you in advance. So thank you, Bill. Also, if you have a question and you have any concerns that I might not get to your question in this live stream, uh, that's a way to get my attention because when you do a super chat, as you can see, it, pow, it, it opened, it's bright in my, uh, in my face and, uh, and I thank you in advance. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. A to Z says, my, my A to Z me, my pinky is a bit temperamental. That's whatever it wants. Yes, that means you're human. It means you're human. Um, mine, sh mine is the same way. <laughs> uh, the more you use it, the better. Um, you, can, you can make opportunities to use it, you know. Hey, Positively Fierce Music. I'm glad you enjoy these live streams. Excellent. Welcome, Positively Fierce Music. Awesome. Alvin, uh, welcome. Um, I'm trying to say some hellos because I appreciate you guys being out here. We have 39 viewers and 35 likes. Not a bad uh, ratio there. If uh, there's a few of you out there who have not given a thumbs up to the live stream, go for it. I always love to see those numbers equal out. Um, and, you know, I enjoy doing these. I fully intend to do these every Saturday. Um, I do have a goal of having 100 simultaneous viewers. Um, over the course of our live streams, we get 100 viewers coming and going. I know because YouTube provides me with more analytics than I, than you could imagine. I know what you guys had for breakfast this morning. I know what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning. Uh, but um, I would love to have, and someday we will, 100 of you at one time. Why is that significant? It's not. It's a round number. And we got 42 right now. So oh, someday I want to have 100 simultaneous i'm um, just so you know live streams uh, like this one my, my live streams typically get about a thousand views over the course of the next four five six days which is awesome i love it and by the way you should still be able to see the chats if you watch this tomorrow the next day whenever you just can't participate in the test but you should be able to you know read my comments my links whatever whatever other folks are saying uh and I hope you do. I hope that's why I timestamp them um, for future reference. So you can say, oh, where did you do that blues riff? You don't have to watch this whole craziness. You can just zip right ahead to the one hour mark or whatever. Um, so, oh, yeah, Scott Rhodes, <laughs> thank you for your plug. I'm getting so close to 200,000 subscribers. And, uh, and again, it's just a big round number. I'm just about at 198. So if those of you who have not subscribed to my channel, it's free, right? It doesn't cost me anything. And uh, it will just make my day. Oh, it will make my day because it's going to happen sooner or later. Um, but oh, it would just be so awesome to have 200,000 YouTube subscribers. So I appreciate those of you who are would consider that right now. Uh, uh, hey, Harmonica and Guitar Progress. Um, you, you bring up uh, one of my favorites, you know, Phil McKnight. Yeah, I, I, I really, I just feel like I know the guy. And that's the thing, right? Us, those of us who are on YouTube, we talk to you and, and we share little stories about our lives. Um, you, you feel like you have to know someone, you know? And so I've been listening, mostly listening to Phil McKnight's podcasts, which I recommend highly. Um, he goes by the name Know Your Gear. Um, and it's much different than what we do here. Uh, in the sense that I want to answer your questions about your guitar progress and your experiences as guitar players, um, specifically regarding material, you know, talking about Lightning Hopkins, talking about blues, talking about um, uh, bending strings, talking about the circle of fifths. And he talks primarily about gear, you know, guitars, amps. Um, so I recommend his stuff highly. So I, uh, I can't even believe that you are mentioning Phil and I in the same in the same uh, breath. Um, okay. Uh, a to Z me says, what does song bike mean? Uh, number one question I get, I think, is what does song bike mean? I was looking for a name for my YouTube channel. Um, and uh, I love songs. I love bikes. I just think the bicycle is an amazing invention. And um, whether you're talking about simply riding through a city street with a basket and some flowers, or you're doing some, you know, more hardcore bicycling 
of some kind. I just think the bicycle is an amazing thing. And songs as, this may sound obvious, but I, I, the reason I play the guitar is to play songs. And that was always my inspiration. And you might say, well, yeah, but, but, but there are some people who are motivated to play amazing guitar solos in the style of whoever, name your favorite guitar soloist. Uh, and that's their motivation. I, in general, I'm perfectly satisfied uh, playing, you know, playing through the, the rhythm guitar part of a song, bringing the song to life. And I, I would love to have someone uh, take a solo while I keep the song going. Um, over the years, partly, partly from teaching and partly just because you can't avoid developing your skills, I've become more of a lead guitar player. My lead guitar, I should say, my lead guitar skills, my improvising skills have improved over the years just because I play the guitar so much and I teach it. Um, but my goal almost entirely was to bring a song to life, meaning to be the guy who could stand up and do a hundred songs um, at the drop of a hat, got my little set list, and know all the chord changes, know all the lyrics, and um, know when a capo <laughs> to, to accommodate for any limitations of my singing voice. And, um, and I did that for many years, you know, having different types of, you know, coffee shop, restaurant kind of gigs where I'd have a set list with dozens and dozens and dozens of songs. That's all I needed. All I needed was to, sit, to see, here's the name of the song. Uh, don't forget, it's uh, capo on the second fret and uh, it's in the key of A. And I, you know, I got to the point where bottom line is that's where I spent my energy, where someone else might be working on sweet picking or playing eruption or other totally, totally valuable things. Don't forget the, the guitar, this is yours to do with as you please. There's no right or wrong. Um, but that was always my main goal and to write songs. Uh, so, so song, bike, the question was, where did the name come from? Yeah, songs and bikes. The, my YouTube channel, believe it or not, was not started by me. <clears throat> so the original name of my YouTube channel, started by one of my students for me, was my first initial and my last name of the number one, J. Kihu One. And you may still see that, you know, when you see my YouTube channel, J. Kihu One, my first initial, my last name, the number one. Uh, I had a student for many years who said, hey, I'm going to film you playing our, the song for our lesson. So when I go home, I will remember what to do. Great idea. He said, don't all your students do this? I said, actually, they don't. He said, why not? I don't know. They just don't, you know. Um, so he had done this with half a dozen of our lessons, a short little 60 second video of me playing the song. I do it one time slowly, one time quickly, go home and work on it. Great idea. He said, I'm, I'm going to start your YouTube channel. This is maybe 2012, maybe. You could look it up. Whatever it says my YouTube channel started, I don't even remember. Let's say 2012. He said, I'm going to start your YouTube channel. I'm going to post these videos. We'll keep them private. But the next time a student wants to learn this song, you can say, oh, go watch this. You can give them the access and you, they can watch it. And I said, that's fine. Um, making videos and YouTube in general is just not on my radar whatsoever. And so he named my YouTube channel, J Kihu One. Uh, when later on, when I started posting videos on YouTube, um, public videos for all of y'all, uh, I thought, man, that name is not a memorable name, J Kihu One. And so I want to get a memorable, memorable name. And as you know, in this day and age, in this you know environment of the internet, you know, you, you got to have some interesting name, right? You can't just call yourself, you know. I mean, looking around at Yahoo and Twitter and Google and all these names, I thought, well, I got to come up with something that's somehow different. You know, I thought, oh, Songbank. Songbank, yeah. Anyways, long story. Thanks for listening. That's <clears throat> where we're at. That's where the name comes from. Oh, and so I didn't I didn't take the JQ1 name off of my channel. I think I was just nervous that I had tagged so many videos with that phrase, JQ1, I thought I'd better leave it in there. So I don't know, maybe it doesn't matter now anymore, but why not? Uh, okay, scrolling my friends. Um, Alvin, Alvin is a bike builder. Alvin, how cool is that? A bike builder. Ah, so cool. Ted Peterson. Hey, Ted, welcome. Uh, Tarahini, welcome. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, Tarahini. Okay, I'm looking for... Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Scott Rhodes saying Scott Rhodes says, I wish I recorded uh, my lesson with my teacher, especially now that he's gone. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. I know, right? Yep. Alvin says, play the beginning lick from the Hollies song, Long Cool Woman. I did a, a YouTube video on that exact song back in the day. Uh, and um, I do not remember. I don't remember most of my videos, folks. <laughs> I don't remember. I really don't. Um, I usually remember the, uh, I remember that I made the video. For a while, I was doing a video a day, a song a day, basically, for about 400 days. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, let me assure you, I don't remember. I would forget the next day. I would forget. So by a week later, I would forget. Hey, that, let's have some fun. Let's have, I have an idea, and I'm going to keep you in suspense for a minute. Today's uh, live stream is brought, brought to us by Vita Coco, coconut water with pineapple. Why not, man? Not from concentrate. Okay, so bear with me while I take a sip here. It's funny. I have a perfectly good microphone here. But my, my impression is that the microphone doesn't always pick up the guitar you know, exactly the way I would want it to, like if this were a recording studio, the guitar, when I listen back, the guitar never sounds as perfectly consistent. The microphone has no problem picking up the sound of any liquid going down my throat. Holy cow, it's almost like that's what the microphone was designed to hear. So yeah, I'm aware that, uh, at least in previous live streams, <laughs> the sound of me drinking liquid is prominent. Let's have some fun. Uh, for about 400 days, I made 400 videos, almost all 400 videos were on very specific songs. Here's my question for you. Wouldn't you be curious as to what the top three most viewed videos are? Let's talk about that. The top three most viewed song videos. So this does not include videos that I made um, about a technique or a concept, the top three song videos. And boy, I was, I was surprised. Um, especially considering number, let me look at my, my list here. I was surprised that uh, number, number one and two didn't shock me. Number three did. And the reason why number three shocked me uh, was it's just not that famous a song. And number two, a uh, reason it shocked me, well, not that it shocked me, but number two, it made me happy that I made that video for myself. I thought, okay, no one's going to watch this one, but I was getting, I think it was, the very last video of the 400 or 399 videos, I think it was the very last one I did. I said, I'm going to do this one for me. No one's going to watch it, but I'm going to do it for me. Okay, so you ready? <clears throat> Again, the three most viewed song videos that I've made. Okay, here it is. Drum roll, please. Number three, and I'm going to include a link in a second. But here's the name of the song. And, and more than one of you, I see 39 viewers at the moment. More than one of you is going to say, huh? I know, I know. But a couple of you are going to say, oh, I love that song. It might just be a couple of you. Okay, here it comes. And again, I'll post the link in a second, the link to the YouTube video. Okay, number three, most viewed song video. There it is. The song is In Spite of Ourselves by John Prine and Iris Dement. And here comes the link. Copy. Here comes the link. Um, and I have a theory. I have a theory. Uh, my theory is this. I think it's 87,000 views. Um, 80, hold on here, 87,000, give or take. Uh, no one else did that song. Um, or maybe I was the first person or I don't know. So anybody looking for that song, I was it. I was the only game in town. That's my theory. I have no idea, you know. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, a, well, it's a popular song. But I mean, when, when you hear what made it to number two and number one, they're just, it's a different, I don't know. Okay, so number two, number two most viewed song video on my on my channel you ready this one will not 
come as a complete shock. Okay, and I'll include a link here as well. Number two, most watched song video, Bad to the Bone by George Thorogood. And here is a link to that video. Okay, that should be the right link. Okay, my friends, and the number one, and I'm super proud of this one. And here's why I'm so proud of this. This is a one of a kind video. Uh, Bad to the bone. I, I, I'm sure it's a perfectly fine video that I made. I think I got it into a little bit of slide playing. Um, that doesn't totally shock me. In spite of ourselves, is uh, yeah, it's it's a popular tune. If you're into slightly obscure songwriter tunes, um, it's a fun tune. Uh, but uh, this next one, I'm especially proud of. <clears throat> because it was my idea. It's my version of this famous tune. I'm going to set my guitar down here. Um, and I thought I'm going to take this famous tune and I'm going to show a very cool way of playing this tune. And I think people will like it. And, and it turned out to be the number one, most, my number one, most viewed uh, song video. Okay, here it comes. I believe I put out this video either Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, maybe New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Some, you know, kind of a bit of a sentimental, sentimental time. Bear with me, bear with me. I'm, I'm typing as fast as my little fingers can. Uh, my chord melody arrangement, and it's easy, folks. You can totally play this song. My chord melody arrangement of What a Wonderful World by... Louis Armstrong, uh, and I'm going to put that link here too. Um, that one, I'm not shocked that it turned out to be a, a somewhat popular video. I would not have expected it was going to be number one. And so today, I'm just learning this today. I didn't, um, this is new knowledge to me as well. Um, I thought, oh, for fun, I would share with you guys, you know, what the popular videos are. And I thought, no way, what a wonderful world. Um, now, the song is, a, is an amazing song. Uh, Louis Armstrong's performance of it is classic. That goes without saying. What makes me proud is I love taking a tune and finding a way that people can play it um, that's accessible, um, that is, uh, I, I don't, notice I'm not saying easy. I like the word accessible. Accessible means with some practice, anybody can play it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it just, it just came out really nice. So I'm glad, uh, I'm glad it became such a popular video. Um, I, I wish I could tell you, you I, I, I don't know the, the finances off the top of my head, but I could actually click on, you know, the, the analytics for these videos and say, oh, that song earned me $16, that song earned me $100 or whatever the case is. Um, I'd have to, I didn't do a deep dive. Um, but I suppose I could say, wow, such and such a video that, that uh, that paid for my new tires. <laughs> that um, that's where the money goes, you know. Houses, cars, mortgage, mortgage and vehicles and uh, stuff like that. But anyway, so thank you for your patience. Thank you for uh, for um, for uh, playing along, everybody. Paul Mayen says whenever I mention I mention John Prine uh, that you get emotional. Yeah, John Prine. <clears throat> he left behind a lot of great music, and that's what can you do, you know? Um, so let's see. I'm, I'm scrolling down. I know I've been talking a lot. I'm not forgetting about your questions. Let's talk about the circle of fifths real quick um, because I have it right here. <laughs> and, uh, and why not? Okay. Well, we're going to keep this quick. Um, I am now holding my hands. My copy of the circle of fifths. Okay. Let's do a quick review. And let, I mean, seriously, five minutes stops, okay? I got 625 on my end. Um, all we're gonna do is the major scale or the key you can call, I'm pointing at the letter C here, the 12 o'clock position of the circle of fifths. You can call, what we're about to do, we can describe this as the C major scale or the key of C. For our purposes right now, those two things mean the same thing. The key of C has no sharp or flat notes. That's why it gets that prominent 12 o'clock position, right? 
it's you know no sharks or flats. Okay, if you're going to ask me what the big significance is at the moment, nah, let's not worry about the significance. It's just a quick review. The key of G has one sharp note, F sharp. Everything else is just like an alphabet letter, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, okay? The key of D, two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. The key of A, three sharps, F sharp, C sharp, and G sharp. The, what we're doing here, I don't expect you to memorize this, just the opposite. I expect you to not memorize it necessarily, but see how I'm indicating the circle of fifths here, see how there's a pattern going on. Oh, you know, you could go as far as say the key of life is figuring out the patterns. By the way, if you figure out the patterns of life, let me know. Um, but certainly in music, part of your musical progress is directly related to your ability to notice patterns, um, including music theory patterns. Okay, so you see the pattern that's going on here. Key of C, no sharps or flats. Key of G, one sharp. D, two sharps. A, three sharps. E, four sharps. The key of B, five sharps. The key of, what do you got there? Uh, uh, F sharp, the key of F sharp, I'm pointing that little F sharp on there, six flats, the key of C sharp, seven flats, and let's pause it right there, okay? Flat side, key of F, one flat note. And again, what does that mean in terms of music theory? When I say the key of F has one flat note, it means all the other notes in the key of F just sound like the alphabet. F, G, A, B flat, that's the one flat note, C, D, E, F, okay? F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. The key of B flat, say it with me, two flats. The key of E flat, three flats. Key of A flat, four flats. Key of D flat, five flats. Key of G flat, six flats. And the key of C flat, seven flats, okay? This is a tool that is almost like an alternative to memorization. And let's leave it at that. We're done, that's it, okay? Um, and I know that was a, a review, um, but you know it's a good review. And then in future live streams, we can just do another quick thing about, okay, so seriously, Jonathan, <laughs> seriously, why does this matter? And how does it make me a better guitar player? Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But I'm still going to encourage you to find a circle of fifths online. Quick Google search, they're free. Um, if you can, look for one that has these little minor key uh, notations in the center of the circle, um, because that's helpful information. They don't all do that. But... Way back on one of our very first live streams, I think I posted a link. It might have been the very first live stream, or the second maybe, probably second. I posted a link to where I got this particular one, and I should do that again. I have to find it again. Okay, we're done. Okay, I'm gonna be wacky here, and I'm gonna start checking things off. Okay, we talked about Lightning Hopkins. We talked about Circle of Fits. We talked about the Bob Dylan podcast. We talked about the Bob Dylan book told you about the my books with a 20% discount for you, my book and ebooks at song-bike.com. I'm going to check off my little note to thank our moderator, Beginner Guitar Lessons. That's part, John, that's part of my thing. I want to say, okay, make sure I thank John. Okay. I have plenty more to talk about, but we're down to the last half hour of the show. So I'm going to scroll up and look for your questions, my friend. Yes, um, harmonic and guitar progress. Bending strings, I got that. I mean, we, we are going to get to that. <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. Okay, I'm looking for any, any more questions beyond the string bending question. We'll talk about string bending in a minute. Um, Yes, Stephen, I am planning. I'll do a quick reminder for you folks. Um, those of you who live anywhere in the vicinity of Southern Maine or New Hampshire. Okay, you ready? This is not a change. This is, as far as I know, this is going to be how it's going to be. Um, uh, next week, I will be on a little Maine vacation. Um, and I would love to meet some of y'all. Uh, Buck Dancer's Choice Music in um, Portland. Wednesday, August 2nd at 4 p.m. You got it. Gary's Music in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Friday, August 4th at 4 p.m. And knock on wood, I haven't got this 100% confirmed, but Toontown Music in Wells, Maine. Um, they suggested a couple different possibilities. So I picked Thursday, August 3rd at 5 p.m. 
And I assume that's okay with them because that's one of the things that they suggested. So uh, I'd love to meet you guys and say hi. And uh, let's buy stuff, okay? Let's support um, some of these places. Just Even just a pack of strings, capo, strap, uh, guitar cable. There's lots of stuff that it's good to have two of. You can never have too many picks, um, an extra set of guitar strings. Uh, those of you who play electric guitar, your electric guitar cable will someday just fail. Um, they, they do, they don't last forever. Um, I suppose the more money you spend, the more likely it is to last forever, but can't hurt to have an extra electric guitar cable. Um, so yeah, so let's spend some money at these uh, shops and, um, and uh, I look forward to seeing any or all of you. I'm gonna try to make this a regular thing. I'm not a big traveler because I'm self-employed. <laughs> so I, I don't get out much, folks. I, I really don't get out much. But um, in the future, I'm going to uh, plan ahead. So when I do get out in the world, um, try to you know connect with a music shop where I'm going and let you guys know way in advance um, so that you can come by and say hi. Uh, oh, um, uh, in Troy, New York. Troy, New York. I'm looking forward to getting to know Collar City Guitars, C-O-L-L-A-R, Collar City Guitars in Troy, New York, um, and <laughs> Love of Fuzz, also in Troy, New York, Love of Fuzz. I've been following them online, and uh, my son's going to be going to school in that vicinity, and I would, I look forward to getting to know those guitar shops. So any of you who live sort of in that Albany, New York area, up around there, um, Sooner or later, I'm going to hopefully do a, like, a meet and greet at, um, at both of those places in Troy, New York. So I'd love to meet some of you there. F to stay on top of lots of stuff that I'm doing, uh, follow me, please, on uh, Facebook or Instagram. Um, I, I don't often post what I'm doing with my life on YouTube, right? YouTube is the videos. Um, but Instagram and Facebook are how you can uh, you know, find out like where I'm going to be or just what I'm up to or what I'm going to be up to. So just type in the, the phrase songbike on Instagram or Facebook, S-O-N-G-B-I-K-E, songbike. And um, you should be able to find my uh, social media accounts pretty quickly on Facebook and Instagram. And then follow me and then you will be in the loop, um, especially if I have to change anything. Oh, for instance, say I couldn't do a podcast. Um, that's where I would let you guys know, hey, sorry, whatever, I'm, uh, I'm sick or I don't know, something happened. And I'm not going to do a podcast this week. That's how I let you guys know. Speaking of which, no podcast next Saturday, the 5th of August. I'll be thinking of you guys. Um, I'm taking that one off, but then I'll be back at it. And uh, I look forward to doing that already. Okay. Hey, Live to Fly channel. Um, Uh, Live to Fly channel. I'm glad you could uh, you could uh, find us here. That's awesome. Um, hey, CLS Crate, you are up in the Troy, New York area. Awesome. Well, we're, we're going to meet sooner or later. Oh, I found a cool guitar that's uh, on sale in Albany. Um, so I, I gotta I gotta check out. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm still shopping for a, a new guitar to um, to reward myself for teaching. The guitar for 30 years. At this point, it's 31 and a half years, but I'm still going to get something. Uh, and I found a cool guitar and I was pleasantly surprised to see that it was a used guitar that was being sold in, in Albany. I thought, oh, I, I'm going to start spending more time in the in that area. So uh, I do plan on um, on getting to know that neck of the woods. So see, a less great. Um, yep, yeah, it's uh, I, I look forward to learning more about the, the ways of Troy, New York and that in that uh, neck of the woods. Okay, uh, a couple of things. Um, I know I I know I know alluded to this at the beginning of the, of the live stream and some of you have been here this whole time. String stretching, I'll make this quick. Uh, when you put on new guitar strings, there's one thing you have to do before you're really done with putting on new guitar strings, which is to stretch the strings. Um, the strings are naturally stretching out anyways. You know, the new guitar strings, you get up to tune, you think you're done and you're not done because the strings are stretching out. You play for five minutes, it's out of tune again, you get frustrated because you didn't stretch your strings. So here's how you stretch your strings. The presumption here is that you put on one or all new strings 
and you put it on properly. So the string is stable. It's stable on this end. It's stable on this end. I'm not going to get into that part of it. That's a, that's a different thing. Although putting on new guitar strings is covered at length in this book right here. 20% off right now, this ebook, The Guitar Year One. Lots of color photos on how to change guitar strings. Okay, string stretching. I'm gonna illustrate this on the fat string. I'm gonna grab the fat string with my thumb parallel to the fat string, right? My fingertips coming under the fat string. And essentially, you push hard with your thumb, push down hard with your thumb, and pull up with your fingers at the same time. And you're stretching the string, okay? Down with your thumb, up with your fingertips. I know here, it doesn't look like much. What if I hold the guitar? Let's see if that's better. You can kind of see, you're flexing the string. And I would say you do it maybe six, seven times. With my fretting hand, I'm actually pressing down hard in my fretting hand. And here's why, this is maybe, I don't know if this is logical, but I'll tell you why I'm holding the string stable with my fretting hand as I stretch it with my picking hand. The reason I'm holding the string stable is I don't want the string to wiggle around in the nut while I'm doing this, because I'm, I'm worried I'm gonna weaken the string. And until someone proves to me that it's not necessary, I'm gonna think it's necessary. So I'm holding the string, I'm kind of pressing down hard with my left hand right there. Not too hard, but you know, I'm squeezing it. <clears throat> Again, my right thumb is pressing down hard towards the floor. At the same time, my fingertips are pulling up towards my right shoulder, you could say. Someone once described this as an S-curve. I'm making an S-curve in the string. Okay, so bottom line is you have the new string. You do, you tune it up. Then you do the string stretching one time. And again, how many, how many flexes? One, two, three, four, five, six, maybe six or seven. I'm, I'm, I'm stretching the string over by the sound hole at the highest frets, at the 12th fret, I'm doing it, my thumb is moving down towards the first fret, okay? You tune it up again, you do it again. You do this whole process three, four times. By the time you do it the fourth time, maybe the fifth time, all of a sudden you do not need to retune your string anymore. No matter how hard you're flexing and stretching the string, it's now been stretched out. You, you essentially have maxed out that string and it's gonna stay in tune for you. You'll notice the first time you do it, even if it was perfectly in tune, now it's way out of tune. The second time, it's pretty darn out of tune. The third time, it's a little out of tune. Fourth, fifth time, you're barely putting it out of tune at all. Get the idea? Okay, and you repeat that process on every new string. Whenever you put on new strings, you do it with new strings. You'll be glad you did, and your guitar will stay looking better, and that is string stretching. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna check that off the list. Scale books. Last week, I was saying to you guys, oh, never buy a chord book. Those big, thick chord books waste of money. And I stand by that. Don't spend your money on those chord books. Spend your money on scale books. And someone said, well, what scale book? So there's lots of scale books. I grabbed this particular one. This happens to be from Alfred Publications, uh, Scales and Modes for Guitar. And it's part of this series called the Basics Series, B-A-S-I-X. I hope it's still in print. Got a sweet Paul Reed Smith guitar on the cover. Uh, I paid 10 bucks for this back in the day. Um, anyways, this is one of many scale books. I recommend this one, but there's plenty of other ones. If there's one thing that makes this one kind of cool is after they show you the scale, and they show you the scale with lots of ways up and down the neck um, or the mode, a mode is just a scale starting on a different note of the scale. So instead of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, imagine starting on me. So you don't play the do, re, you start on me. And you go from, instead of going do up to the next do, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, you're starting on the me. I can't sing it, but you're starting on the me and going to the next me. That, that's all a mode is, don't, don't overthink it. What I like about this book is when they introduce something, I'm gonna say the, the Dorian mode. When they introduce the Dorian mode, before they wrap up their discussion of the Dorian mode, they have a page full of Dorian licks. Dorian licks in the style of Eric Johnson. Dorian licks in the style of John Schofield. They didn't have to do that. A lot of skill books don't do that. I like that this book does that. 
Um, so when I was grabbing this uh, to show you guys today, I thought, wait a minute, I recognize that cover. And that's because I have another book from the exact same series. I thought, oh, I should show you guys this book too. Again, from the Alfred Publications Basics series, Rock Guitar Techniques. And again, I paid 10 bucks Paid 10 bucks for this back in the day. I hope it's still in print. Looks like a nice Les Paul on the cover. Uh, and this book, man, I've, I've got a lot of use out of this as a, you know, for my own education and as a teacher. Topics include, oh, this will segue into the bending part. Topics include uh, tapping, bending, string skipping, sweep picking, hammer-ons, pull-offs, picking in general. I bet the picking thing must be about down-up picking. Yeah, yeah, it's about down-up picking. Um, just that for, for 10 bucks, even if it's 15 bucks now, it's a cool book. Yeah. Um, let's give some credit where credit is due. Rock Guitar Techniques by Jeff McErlane. Jeff, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. M-C-E-R-L-A-I-N. Jeff McErlane, Rock Guitar Techniques. And the Scales and Mode. It took two people to write this book, Scales and Modes for Guitar. Steve Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, and Ron Manis, M-A-N. U.S. Ron Menace. Um, yeah. So I'm guessing that if these two Alfred books from the basic series are cool, I bet there's other ones that are too. So other other titles in this series, in case you're curious, include um, <clears throat> one called Scales and Arpeggios. Oh, I'm a big fan of Arpeggios, folks. Arpeggios are so good. One called Blues Guitar Techniques, Jazz Guitar Concepts. One that's called Essential Licks. Those all sound good to me. I'm such a book geek, man. One that's called Guitar Theory. Um, I would I would grab all those. Uh, you know, I go to used bookstores and make a beeline for some sort of music section if they have one. And um, I, I know I'm lucky, but uh, you know, I have a bookstore that I go to that sometimes has dozens of interesting looking books for four bucks each. And it's a beautiful thing. Okay. So uh, I'm going to check that off my list here. Okay, scale book. We covered this scale book. Any questions from you guys? We've got about um, 20 minutes left here. Uh, <laughs> Live to Fly channel says about the string stretching. You say, uh, I usually just slap strings on and go to town. Well, that's another way to, to break in the strings. Um, but you're just, you know, you're going to find yourself retuning a lot. And, you know, <clears throat> so, you know, the string stretching goes a long way um yeah scott Rhodes says that he just got a book called guitar scales in context Ooh, context context is everything right by joseph alexander excellent the the, the absolute number one reason i even bring up scale books is it, it's the best possible exercise for your left hand period um if you have a better idea for how to get better at playing the guitar with your left hand. Hey, man, you write that book. But um, oh, so this ties in with another thing for my checklist. I shall check this off too. What I would do differently. Now, this is a big, big subject. So I might need another sip of Vita Coco coconut water. You're probably supposed to shake it. And now, here's the big question that I put the cap on tight enough. We're about to find out. <laughs> Woo! Taking my life in my own hands there. Okay. I don't know how to do this without the microphone. Oh, you know what I can do? I'm gonna I'm gonna turn down the volume. Okay, let's try this. Okay, I'm gonna mute the volume. And I'm back. All right. Hopefully that, I hope that spared you the sound of my throat. Uh, what I would do differently, I could talk about this forever, and, but I won't. <laughs> like a gentleman, a gentleman is someone who knows how to play the accordion, but doesn't. <laughs> um, so, but I'll, I'll keep it short today, and maybe in the future I will do more of a presentation of what I would do differently. Um, I, if I could go back in time, 16 years old, get my first guitar, a sweet 1963 Guild Starfire, played and modified almost certainly by a professional working musician, beautiful guitar. To this day, I remember the feeling very well of bringing the guitar home from the music shop, 
$225 plus tax. They wanted $250. And I was 16. I thought, I'm not paying the asking price. <laughs> I thought I was so smart, man. So I offered them two and a quarter and they took it plus tax. Okay. Uh, I still remember the feeling of bringing home the guitar and, and like opening the case and think to myself, I, I can't believe they let me just, I can't believe you can just get one of these things. It was like, it was the equivalent of getting a car or something. Remember that feeling of, you know, you got your license and you drive down the road and you, and you think to yourself, everyone's okay with this? Like, you just, you can just do this? And, uh, you know, little do you know, your parents are paying a fortune for your car insurance and, you know, and for your driver's ed and all that kind of stuff. But that's how I felt. I, I, I opened the guitar case at home. I looked at that. I thought, I can't believe. I can't believe. Like, I don't even have a metaphor for for that. It's like, uh, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about a metaphor. It's beyond a metaphor. It is the metaphor. I don't know. So, but what would I tell that 16-year-old? Um, oh, man. Scales. Every day. Every day. Practice your scales. Use as many of your left hand, fretting hand fingers as possible when you play the scale. Or if they tell you which fingers to use, do what they tell you. But without a doubt, use this, you know, use all your fingers every day. And if you can't stand doing the scales for an hour, five minutes. Don't just play them, memorize them, you know, memorize scales. At a minimum, it's great for your brain. You might, you might not use the mixolydian mode anytime during your first year of guitar playing. Doesn't mean you shouldn't practice it. And, and memorize it makes you smart. It, it gets your brain, it turns your brain to a guitar brain where you are, you are uh, processing information that a guitar player needs to, to process. You know, you're thinking, ter- if it's tab, you're thinking in terms of lines and numbers and visual shapes in the fretboard. So man, I would, I, would be, get, I would get the guitar and a scale book right away. Um, and if scales ever feel, feel boring, you know, after a few practice sessions a week, whatever, well, number one, uh, move on to some other scale. doesn't matter which one you practice, not, not for this purpose. The purpose of waking up your, probably your weak hand. If you're right-handed, you're fretting with your left hand. You've never told your left hand to do any stuff like this before. So yeah, man, from day one, scales, are arpeggios. Um, you don't have to know the music theory. This is not about music theory. This is about the absolute fastest route to having smart, strong, coordinated left hand or fretting hand fingers. Absolutely. What else would I do differently? I would, um, I, I, in my defense, I did get down to business learning the basic chords. So I didn't waste too much time there because I knew chords are important. Oh, strum patterns, strum patterns, whatever it takes, whether, whether it's paying a teacher for lessons or whatever it takes, got to learn different strum patterns. Even if you only know three chords, you can strum those three chords so many different ways, and you will strum those three chords so many different ways, not an infinite number of ways, but a variety of ways. And the sooner you start, you know, on a list of those common strum patterns, the better. Finger picking, I thought finger picking, I thought you had to be some kind of genius. I, I would, I, you could have started, I could have started finger picking from day one, practically. Certainly if you can, if you can form any chord, any chord, A minor, E minor, you can begin working on your finger picking, you know. By the way, Strum Pattern Bible. Oh, this is the book. <laughs> this is the book I wish I got. Talking about wishing I did something differently. This is the book I wish magically. If I could go back in time, I would give myself this book. That, that's part of my reason. Okay, between you and me, we're all friends here, right? All 45 of us. My teaching is partly or largely based on how, how baffling the guitar was to me as a young guy who didn't take lessons. Yeah, that's when I, when I look at what I teach and how I teach, it, it, it's as if, bear with me here, bear with me, it's as if I'm reaching back to 1985 to that kid and say, oh, buddy, <laughs> take a breath, take a breath. Let me set you straight. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. Be patient. You know, there's a whole lot of, oh, man. So, yeah, when I, when I think about not, not, not only my philosophy about what, how I teach or, you know, what teaching means to me, but, but on a practical level, <clears throat> I'll say to students, 
hey, this you have to learn how to strum this, this strum. You're gonna use this for a million songs. It's a practical skill, you know? So yeah. Um, okay, what I would do differently. Uh, improvising, holy cow. I thought, I thought you had to be some sort of genius to make up a guitar solo. Have you seen the people who play guitar solos? <laughs> Do they look like geniuses? <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I had no concept. Improvising, whether you can do it like a hotshot guitar player or not, that's a separate issue. But understanding what it means, how you begin improvising, I could have understood that as a young guy. Okay, so, okay, I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. You need to match the scale with the song. If the song's in the key of G major, you're gonna improvise with a G major scale. Am I simplifying? Yep. Does it work? Yep, <laughs> you know, okay. But but as a starting point, I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't, I thought, I just see guys flying up and down the neck, oh man bending strings or oh, we won't get to bending strings in a second um so yeah i thought oh man I, so so now if i could go back i'd say get a cassette tape and record yourself playing any two chords but i would in this situation i'd say hey how about e major i'm gonna start on e major for maybe eight slow strums and then after eight slow strums of e major how about eight slow strums of a major right back and forth and, and record myself for a solid three minutes. Nothing but those two chords. The reason why you want to do it for multiple minutes is because once you begin improvising, you'll be, you're gonna start having fun and you're not gonna to wanna to have to rewind the tape or even in this day age, record stuff on your phone. You're not gonna to wanna to have to every 20 seconds start over again, okay? And I'd say, okay, Mr. Mr. Young Improviser, let's, let's learn an E major scale. You know, an open position, you know, an E major scale. And I would say, take 20 minutes and just mess around with no, no specific goals. Just mess around with an E major scale while you listen to yourself strum the E's and A's in the background, you know? Okay, I didn't know that, <laughs> you know? I didn't know that's how you, I didn't know that was the first step, you know? I couldn't imagine what the first step was. The first step was having amazing fingers. Well, where do you get those, you know? I don't know. I still don't know where to get those. Okay, so but you get the idea. And then just to finish this thought, I would say to that 16-year-old, okay, now, now that you've got your E major scale uh, memorized and you've played it like a crazy person sounding horrible because you just go beep, 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 and you're not even listening to the E's and the A's in the background because no one does it first. Now I'm going to learn about target notes. What does that mean? It means when the rhythm guitar player changes the A chord. How many of you play the note A? Well, where's the note A? Well, you gotta find it, big shot. <laughs> find the note A. Make sure you play the note A exactly when the guy plays the A chord. You know, do you get how that's gonna sound good? <laughs> well, but you gotta learn where that A is, you know. When the when, it, when the rhythm guitar changes back to an E major chord, well, where's your E? Well, you have a couple of different E's to choose from. Okay, well, pick one. And then you gotta be listening. So you gotta be counting. Here comes the seventh A chord. Here comes the eighth A chord. Okay, after eight, you know the song has changed to an E major chord, right? So you're counting the A chords. Here's the A, the sixth time, the seventh time, the eighth time. Get your E ready, get your E ready. Bang, hit that E. Is it slow? Is it, does it feel rudimentary? Yeah, yeah, but you start doing that when the, on your first week of having the guitar, your first month, you get those ideas in your head. The world is your oyster. Where did that phrase come from? I don't. I don't want the world to be my oyster. <laughs> I can think of some. World is my pizza. World is my a pizza. Hey, where's uh, Charlie Beagle? Charlie, what the heck? You can't just not take part in our live. Someone, someone, call up. Uh, get get <laughs> A to Z me says an oyster salesman. <laughs> Start that phrase. Uh, someone get uh, Charlie Beagle on the wire. I. I I can't, I can't do this without Charlie people. What the heck? Um, okay, so though, just to give you an idea, those are some things I would totally do differently as a beginning guitar player. Working on my physical skills, such as scales, arpeggios, um, just as a pure physical exercise, <clears throat> and then conceptual stuff, such as improvising, you know, 
um, and strum patterns, which are, I guess, a physical thing, but it's also a concept. You want to have a, you want to have a concept. What's the best way to strum this song? Or how is that person strumming the song so I can imitate it? Okay, thank you, folks. Oh, uh, last week <laughs> I almost I almost finished a thought. I was so close. Talk about a baseball metaphor last week of uh, when a pitcher is having a bad outing and the manager has to make a decision. Do you yank the pitcher? Uh, maybe the bases are loaded and, and the home run hitter is at bat, you know. Do you yank the pitcher or do you show the pitcher that you have faith that they can work their way out of the inning, right? And, uh, and I mentioned to you folks that leaving the pitcher in is exactly what's going through my mind, 100%. When I work with a student and I see them doing something and it's not going well, but it's, I can almost hear it getting better and I zip my lip and I let them work through it because I can see every time they do that thing, they're getting better and they don't need me to open my mouth. They need me to, in fact, keep my mouth closed and let them just do it 10 times in a row. So I call that leaving the pitcher in. Sometimes you leave the pitcher in and you let them work it out. You, you, they believe in themselves, right? You know, hopefully you know that feeling of you're doing something on the guitar and you can actually feel yourself getting better at it. And that's just such a great feeling that it could be everything from an E minor chord to an E minor pentatonic scale to some crazy hotshot stuff. That feeling of getting a little bit better. Ooh, that's a powerful feeling, right? It's a powerful feeling. I, I, I've never gotten over that feeling. I don't want to get over that feeling. Uh, in fact, my problem is I want that feeling on other instruments. I, I, want to, I want to experience that on a variety of instruments. It's tough when you really should get good at one instrument, right? I mean, in theory, you should stick with one thing. Okay, so what I didn't, what I didn't, the final point was I, I encourage you to be that way with yourself. You, you are the manager and you are the pitcher, okay? You're doing something and like it's not, you don't feel that progress. You get 10 times, you don't feel that progress. Go easy on yourself, you know, don't yank the pitcher, go easy on yourself, let yourself work through it. It's possible that you just need to do it four more times or it's gonna to happen tomorrow, but that's something I want you to take away with you. So just leave the pitcher in, you'll, you'll work your way through it, have faith in yourself that you'll get it, okay? So that's what I meant to conclude with. <laughs> Last live stream, I didn't say those last words. Leave the pitcher in, let, let that pitcher work through the inning. Uh, it's gonna be okay. Because let's face it, guitar is a frustrating thing. Okay, bending strings, bending strings. I wonder if, I wonder, did that take long enough? Here we are at, at hour two, did that take long enough? Did I build the suspense long enough about bending strings? Okay, uh, I'm gonna illustrate this on uh, acoustic guitar. Bending strings is easier on electric guitar. So this is lesson number one. If you have one of each, but you, you're new to string bending, do it on an electric guitar for sure. Um, uh, if you only have an acoustic guitar, don't worry, nothing wrong with that. Um, just know that it's a little bit harder on acoustic guitar because the strings are fatter, you know, that's all. Um, why do you even want to bend a string? It's a fair question, right? Why? Why does it matter? You know, when you bend a string, and I'm going to, um, Uh, I'm going to focus on the second string, the B string 12th fret with my ring finger. Why do you want to bend a string? Bending a string sounds like the human voice, right? The human voice. The best thing you can do on any instrument, or let's say the top two things you can do on any instrument, is to make your hunk of wood and metal and plastic and glue sound like the human voice. The best compliment any one musician can give to another musician is something along those lines, you know? The guitar sounds like the person is crying or it's an emotional sound or, you know? It, so bending is, is one physical... Is a, is a physical uh, attempt, hopefully successful attempt, to add an emotional human sound to what otherwise is a bunch of wood and metal and an object that's sadly not alive. You make it sound like it's alive. Okay, so that's why you'd want to do bending in the biggest sense. Um, you could just say bending sounds cool. Also true, also valid and reason enough. Okay, so uh, what's weird about bending is you are, 
manipulating the string in multiple directions. As you always are, you're pressing the string hard into the fretboard, right? We do it all the time. It leaves a little mark in your finger. And that part's not gonna change. You are still pressing relatively hard. Don't overdo it, but relatively hard down into the wood, right? But you're also pushing across the wood. So it's, it's a weird thing, right? It's weird. Okay. How are you sick? How do you get successful at it? It starts with a clear note. If 12 on the B string isn't ringing clearly like that, bending it is not going to make it sound better. I see a lot of people say that they watch my hands and they put their hands where my, my, their fingers where my fingers are. They pluck the note and they bend all in one big motion. And it, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do it wrong. Bear with me. It's, it's hard to play wrong sometimes. Uh, I was hoping for more of a dead, that dead sound. I don't know. I, I, it's, I, <laughs> we'll get back to playing it wrong in a second. But I'll, st I'll say this again. It has to be written clearly for the next thing to happen. So uh, the next thing, I'm, I'm going to call this what it is, a three-finger bend. Why am I using three fingers? More power, more control. Um, by the way, I'm doing this up at the 12th fret uh, because in general, strings are easier to bend the further you get from the nut. The nut is that white piece right there down, you know, where the strings exit the fretboard and, you know, enter the headstock area. Uh, the nut, among other things, it keeps the strings in line, right? All those, those six slots. We are essentially bending the string out of line and the nut is fighting that, but it has less of a fighting effect on us when we're way up high, let's say the 12th fret. Okay, so that's why I'm illustrating this way up on the 12th fret. A three finger bend, ring finger 12 on the B string, middle finger 11 on the B string, index finger 10 still on the B string. Three fingers touching the same string makes a nice little line. I'm going to hold this up to the camera a little bit more, but I think you guys get the idea. Uh, so all three fingers are simultaneously pressing down into the wood, you know, down directly into the wood, like the way they always would be, I mean, that direction. But once I pluck it and get that nice ring sound, I'm gonna push the strings across the wood. So you could say I'm doing two things at once. One thing that people do wrong, and maybe this is sort of what I was getting at before, they, what is it? I see it all the time. I think I've got it. When they go to bend the string, across the wood, they stop pressing down into the wood and you can't. So you've really got to maintain the pressure against the fretboard, even as you're, and I, I think this is a scraping motion because you are, you're scraping your, in this case, your second skinny string, the steel string, the B string, you're scraping it across, across the fretboard, okay? <clears throat> By the way, we're starting this using three fingers because frankly, it's easier with three fingers. Not every bend is a three finger bend. We'll get to that. Okay. Where is my thumb? There's not one place your thumb has to be. You'll, you can see my thumb is up here hanging over the, the neck. But I can get the same effect. I'm gonna flip my guitar a little bit. I can get the same effect with my thumb Let's call this in the center of the neck, the round part of the neck. See how you cannot see my thumb? It's fine. I can still, especially with three fingers like this, I can still get a, a perfectly satisfying bend. It feels better to me to have my thumb up here. But I admit your thumb doesn't have to be there. So, you know, experiment. Whatever you do, your thumb cannot ever, ever, ever come out and show itself under the neck, right? I know, I know some of you are saying, what kind of person would do that? I, I see people do it sometimes absentmindedly, especially beginners. Their thumb all of a sudden is making an appearance, although by the skinny E string. <laughs> okay, so hey, you guys are paying me good money here. I gotta, I gotta cover all the bases. 
Okay, so a three finger bend. Doing on the third string, on the fourth string. As you can imagine, if I'm bending the fat sixth string, I cannot push it towards my face because it'll go right off the fretboard. So nothing wrong in, with any string and pulling it down towards the skinny string. You can do that with any string. I see people bending down towards your leg. For some reason, I've never felt right about that. It only feels right to me to bend up towards my, up towards my chin, so to speak. Um, but in, I'd have to stop and think, other than on the sixth string, where you have to bend down towards the floor. I guess sometimes I do that in the fifth string. I don't know. To be continued, right? When to bend down and when to bend up. Just know that if you find yourself bending down, it's not a problem, although it depends on what you're going to play after the bend. There's, in a certain context, you may have to push the string up towards your face based on what you're going to do next, or vice versa. Okay. Uh, a one-finger bend. You're going to have less strength, right? You're dealing with one finger. I'm, uh, I'm going to stick with the 12th fret. I'm on the 12th fret. Let's stick with the 12th fret on the second string. So just my index fingers there. Most of the time when you are asked to bend with one finger to be your index finger, it's also, not coincidentally, a very small bend, what they call a quarter bend. A quarter bend is basically the least amount of modifying or embellishing, whatever you want to call it. It's the least amount of muscle, a quarter bend. You're just changing the note just enough that you've changed it without a profound change in the pitch of the note. A three-finger bend, you can make a B sound like a C sharp. You can make something sound like a totally different note. In fact, sometimes that's the whole point, like literally. You're making one note, like the 12th fret note, sound like the 14th fret note. We'll get to that in a second. Um, a one-finger bend, the, my experience, the vast majority of the time I'm being asked to do a one-finger bend, it's a very s small amount, which is great because it's only one finger. Okay. So hopefully, I'm looking in the chats right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep talking about bends. But I'm looking in the chats just in case... Someone is like, what did you just say? I don't understand that at all. And I don't, I don't uh, see anybody who is like completely baffled by what I'm saying, which is great, which is great. Okay. Uh, so um, if you want an exercise, of course you do, right? This is going to be true for any guitar, uh, electric, acoustic, whatever. Here's an exercise. And this is an extremely practical exercise. You won't regret doing this. Bend a certain note, a certain fret, and try to match it to the very next fret. So here's second string 12. That's what I'm going to bend with three fingers. And I'm going to bend it to try to precisely match the sound of the second string 13. Here's the second string 13. Okay, here's 12. Here's 13. You gotta keep those sounds in your head, specifically the 13, you gotta keep that. Okay, so here's my bend. I'm still thinking that 13 sound. In my mind, that's a pretty, that's a, a you know, pretty close. Here's 12, here's 13, here's 12 being back to sound like 13. So you can go back and forth. In this particular context, play 13 and then slowly you know here's a, here's I'm gonna bend too much so you can hear the difference I'm gonna get a little closer to the mic here I'm gonna bend 12 so I bend it past the 13th fret pitch rise here's 13 Okay, more muscle, I'm not a good idea. I mean, meaning if I'm shooting for 13, don't overbend it, you know. Uh, that's the follow up to this bending 12, so it sounds like 14. Do you want to take more muscle, right? Here's 14. Here's bending 12, so it sounds like 14. 14, and the bend.
okay? Uh, the reason I say this is a practical exercise um, because it matters. Don't just bend stuff willy-nilly. Um, it, it matters, you know? Uh, if you're bending 12 to sound like 13, one fret high, that's called a half bend. And um, especially if you're learning this out of a, a, a legit book, they'll have a little one half fraction. It's usually an arrow curving up in a one half. If it's a full bend, it'll be a one with an arrow curving up. And that's when you make 12 sound like 14. Make the notes sound like two frets higher, a, a whole step, okay? Half step bend, you're bending it so it sounds like the very next fret, like 12 to 13. Whole step bend, making it sound like the note two frets higher, making 12 sound like 14. You don't need a song to do this, meaning you can do this as simply as an exercise. But then when you need it for like a, a certain guitar solo, you'll have the skills to do it. You don't have to wait for a song to come along. You know, you can just do this as an exercise. Could it get tedious after five or 10 minutes? Yeah, it could. You could also just get sore. So, but if you do this a little bit every day, that's a great idea. Great idea. Uh, I was gonna say one more thing. Okay, this is something that's tricky to address. It, this will be my last thing about bends. I know we should wrap up soon. My last thing about bends, it's a big deal because it's a frustrating thing. And I'm sorry, I'm not gonna give you a, a super concrete uh, advice. <laughs> I remember very well bending a note pretty successfully, but my fretting fingers would inevitably twang and do some noisy crap on the other strings. And no matter how successful the bend was, it just, the sound after the bend or as I did what they call a release. A release just means you stop pushing and bending so much, you let the string come back down to its natural position. It could still be ringing. See how it's still ringing? Even now, that's called a release. So when you release a bend, you should have the skills to maintain the pressure so it's still ringing even after the bend. At least if you're supposed to, that's usually a downward curving arrow with a letter R, a release. Um, but as an exercise, oh yeah, you should be able to bend release, okay, but that's not what I'm getting at right now. What I'm getting at is inevitably, anybody working on bending, you're gonna unintentionally twang other strings and they're gonna make a sound and it's gonna make you nuts. And I promise you that doesn't last forever. But if you were to ask me exactly, exactly how do you stop doing that when it seems impossible, right? Because you can see with my fretting hand, as I, as I bend, you can see, look what's doing the other strings, right? I'm like, I'm totally uh, flexing right into the other strings. Um, and how do you not twang those with your fingernail, with your flesh? Um, that's, that's where I can assure you the day will come where you will not twang those strings, but I don't have like a cute exercise. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's a frustrating thing at first. I can tell you that it's just yet another reason to keep your fretting hand fingernails as short as possible. That's part of the solution. Um, just understand that I understand how frustrating it is when that happens and that you will, that will not always happen. And I'll give it some thought because you know my my job is to is to give you guys some some concrete direction and not just say ah it's going to be all right even though it is going to be all right. Okay, and you guys, you're hanging in there to the end. I got 30. Oh, we got 32 of you hanging in there and 41 likes. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay, Charlie Beagle, <laughs> there you are, man. Well, Charlie, you know. I hope you're having fun, Charlie. The rest of us are pursuing, you know, mastering the guitar. I hope you're having fun doing whatever you were doing tonight. While the rest of us, you know, we're putting in the time, man. We're putting in the time. Okay, I am. Uh, I am scrolling here, folks, because heaven forbid I go for more than two hours and miss a question. Uh, North Country Fisher says, can you use the A minor pentatonic pattern for every key up and down the neck? Yes, it's a beautiful thing. Long story short, uh, pentatonic patterns, any pentatonic pattern you ever learn has two identities, two names, a major name and a minor name. And every pentatonic pattern can be moved up and down the neck and the name is gonna change. Um, but you only have to learn pentatonics one time but you get to apply them two times. 
And that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> you know, imagine you playing in a country band on a Friday night and Saturday night you play in a blues band. And imagine this, to solo in both contexts, you don't have to necessarily exactly learn a whole new set of skills. It's a pretty beautiful thing, you know? Now, I, I, I'm simplifying for those of you who are scale experts. I know I'm simplifying here, but it doesn't change the fact that pentatonics are a beautiful thing and uh, <clears throat> you can use them in so many contexts without having to relearn um, a whole new set of scales for a different contexts. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and North County Fisher, I would love to pick up on that next time with uh, with sort of examples. And I mean, we could do a whole live stream on pentatonic scales and putting them to use so that you can memorize them without feeling like you're memorizing them. You do anything for half an hour, you memorize it no matter what, right? Um, so if I can, or, or when I give you a context where you want to do something for half an hour, guess what? You'll end up memorizing it and we both win. Um, it's a beautiful thing. I win because in my mind, I made the world a better place because <laughs> you're rocking out, you know? Um, and you win because you're jamming on pentatonic scales up and down the neck. Um, <clears throat> uh, Live to Fly channel. Uh, the Strum Pattern Bible. Yes, that is my book. Uh, it's an e-book available at www.song-bike.com. You buy it, you get 20% off if you enter the coupon code LIVESTREAM20, LIVESTREAM20, all one word, LIVESTREAM20, you get 20% off. You get the book delivered to your email inbox immediately. You're welcome to print out the whole book. My advice is to save some paper and only print out the the things that you want. Um, no matter what, the video that accompanies every single page of that book is available on my website for free for anybody, anybody. Um, you just go to my website and I think you start off by clicking on the cover of that book and then it says view video here or maybe you don't even have to click on the cover but it's, it's easy peasy to find the video that goes along with every page of that book. Uh, Puba John asks a good question. Why would I need to know how many sharps or flats in the key? Um, yep. Uh, number one, bragging rights so that you're the smart person in the room. Not, not the worst reason to be good at something, right? Because you're the smart dude. You become the smart dude. Um, secondly, it helps you figure out stuff. So when someone says, um, oh, I, let, I wrote a song and the chords go C, A minor, uh, G. That's the first half of the, you know, that's the verse, C, A minor, G. And the chorus is F, C, G. And you're like, ooh, I'm ready to play a solo on that. In fact, I'm ready to, I'm ready to um, tell them how their song could be better. Not that you would ever do that. But I'm ready to be like, hey, man, why don't you introduce a, you know, a D minor chord? Why don't you make this, why don't you, instead of playing G, why don't you play G7? Hey, have you ever thought of doing this? Not that you should tell your friends that their songs need help. But um, how about they've written a song and they don't have a bridge and you're like, ah, let me help you with a bridge. I'm gonna write a heck of a bridge. It's because you're smart, you know? It's funny because being smart makes you a better guitar player if you consider being smart as knowing all the options that are waiting for you. That's, that's, that's a good guitar player. Or put it this way, that's a good musician. So my hope for everybody, all 33 of you, and the hundreds and hundreds of people who will watch this live stream down the road is that you guys become good musicians. Good musicians, you can be a good musician, not even have, uh, not even have all the working fingers on your hand. This is gonna be part of my show and tell, Django Reinhardt. Wow. What can you say about Django Reinhardt? Uh, terrific, terrific. I mean, I, I don't even have a good adjective for Django Reinhardt. Um, I did not have the use of all his left hand fingers. Okay, but he was a great musician. Now he could actually play super fast. <laughs> he found ways to do it. Um, but my point is, my hope for you guys is not that you're fast guitar players or not that you're awesome at bar chords. That's not my true hope. My true hope is that you guys are good musicians. You know. Um, 
I know it, maybe you, this might sound like semantics to some of you, but some of you are like, yeah, I'd rather be a good musician. You know, a good musician can choose to do things or can choose not to do things, but you you make great musical choices. Or you can offer your, in the context where there's a band or recording studio or whatever, you can offer great options. You say, oh, you want this thing? Or do you want it this way, this way, this way? Because you are capable as a, as a musical person, you know what these different options are. And then people look at you like, oh man, well, uh, since you're showing me three different things, I'll, I'll take the second one. I love that second thing. But inside you're thinking, where did, where did that person learn all that cool stuff, you know? Um, okay. Uh, we're going to wrap up in a minute, you guys. Paul says, can you play a little intro to Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here? Can I? Can I? They take away your guitar license if you, can, if you can't play that. Solos of all time. I love the next part so much, but I, I don't have it off the tip of my memory, so I'm not gonna, uh, I should just go for it. somewhere you know um i love that guitar solo okay i have teacher itis teacher itis means when it's in front of me i can play it slowly and perfectly 10 times in a row because that's what teachers do right they illustrate they illustrate performers different skill set right different skill set anyways yeah um my quick comment about <clears throat> um about Wish You Were Here, because I know a bunch of you either know it or want to know it or are working on it. The first part I played, that, that, you know, rhythm guitar part, your ring and pinky will, will stay, should stay glued down permanently, so to speak, on the first two treble strings. Pinky, first skinny string, third fret, ring finger, second skinny string, third fret to achieve all this those two fingers stay there that whole time you're doing all this chord changing they stay there the whole time um, this topic is covered in easy guitar chord and lead tricks by Jonathan Q uh, the back cover refers to me as Acclaimed YouTuber, Jonathan Kiyo. So I will come home from work certain days and say to my wife, oh, the acclaimed YouTuber got a flat tire today. The acclaimed YouTuber uh, almost ran out of gas. Uh, yes, that's me. Um, so, but, but what we call wish you were here to avoid any copyright issues in this book, I call it the E minor seven trick. Yeah, the E minor seven trick. 20% off, friends. Um, although if you buy this book now and save 20%, I'm sorry, I won't be shipping it for a week, but I will ship it to you, you know, um, for 20% off. Uh, I'm just, I'm headed out of town, so I don't that. But essentially it's like what you need for Wish You Were Here without calling it Wish You Were Here. Um, so, okay, you guys, I'm talking so much. I've covered, I didn't even get to Roy Clark. Okay, real quick, Roy Clark, amazing guitar player. Why is not, why is Roy Clark not a household name the way all these other guitar players are household names? I mean, I'm kind of late to the party, 
But I want to make mention of this at some point one of these live streams. What a fantastic guitar player. Um, I think Roy Clark had so much fun while he was playing and, and was an entertainer. And maybe, um, maybe people enjoyed him, but didn't take him seriously the way they might take another guitar player of equal skill seriously because Roy Clark came across as, a, as an entertainer with his own TV show and stuff. Whoa, Roy Clark, man. I don't know. So I'll throw that out there. Okay, I am going to look for the last few questions here. And I'm going to remind you that I'm not going to see you guys next Saturday. So I'm going to see you in two weeks. Um, I'm looking up for any more before I say good night. Looking for any, I saw a few questions and I'm going to bang those out. Because I know I missed a couple here. I know I thought I missed a couple. Am I crazy? Okay. Uh, Stephen asked, am I a Red Sox fan? Yes. Not only was I born in Boston, not only am I a Red Sox fan, but I was at game six. And if you are a Red Sox fan, there's, you know, there's only one game six that a Red Sox fan would say, yeah, I was at that game. I've got a, I've got a good Red Sox story about being at game six to be continued. <clears throat> Walter says, what do I think of inverted chords? Yes, inverted chords. Um, without knowing exactly, exactly what you're exactly referring to, Walter, um, learn as many chords as possible, up and down the neck, everything from the old standby C and A minor, all those down here, to bar chords. Yep, you want to learn bar chords. You want to uh, learn up the neck chords. Ooh, I have, if you go to my YouTube channel after this live stream, I have a couple of recent videos on up the neck, major and minor, and I think dominant seven chords. Um, so without, again, knowing exactly what you mean by inverted chords, um, yes, Walter, you want to learn as many chords as possible with the understanding that you'll use what you need to use. Um, so for instance, if, if I'm up at an open mic and I'm singing songs and open mic, I'm going to, my left hand is going to be playing a lot of chords down here, right? Acoustic guitar, I'm singing. And, you know, if I'm, if someone else is doing that, and I'm accompanying them at, at the open mic and I'm sitting in with them and I'm not strumming and singing because they're doing that, then I will play a variety of chords, which you might refer to as inverted chords, um, up the neck. Then I'm going to do a lot more interesting, creative stuff because they've got those big old cowboy chords down there. So um, I'm happy to talk about this more in the future, but um, yep. Okay, you guys, I think I'm going to call it two and a half hours of guitar q a live stream live stream number 11 is in the books um thank you for being here 35 of you what the heck 35 of you i know it's either getting late or getting early depending on where some of you are thank you for being here my friends um we will uh we will do this again in two weeks august 12 august 12 should be a saturday night same time same everything uh you know, I look around as if I don't know what I'm expecting to see. I'm just looking at my list. Yep. We didn't get to talk too much about being self-motivated versus being at risk. You guys are self-motivated, believe me. At risk is uh, an at-risk student is someone who um, who I I watch them as the weeks go by and they're they're not uh, making making progress in a way that pleases them. I might be totally satisfied, but an at-risk student. Um, I think, ooh, we got to make something happen. This person, it's not that I'm going to lose them as a student. That, that doesn't bother me. That's not the complete concern. It's more like uh, this, this person is doing better than they think they are. And uh, I, don't, I don't want them to drop this. You know, I, I don't want them to lose this part of their life, an at-risk student. Um, so this is how I think about you all in a, in a big general sense. You know, um, I, I realize that the term at-risk <laughs> is used in, in more like uh, dire circumstances than I'm using it. Um, but that just shows how seriously I take my job. Okay, you guys, uh, I don't have any cute way to say goodbye. So I'm going to say uh, farewell. 
I'll see you in two weeks if you're in Maine or New Hampshire. I hope we can connect uh, at the little stops I'm making uh, next week. Hope you're staying cool if it's especially hot where you are. Um, I will see you in a couple of weeks. Play your guitar. Enjoy your guitar. Don't forget to stretch your fingers. Don't forget to stand up and stretch your back while you play. I'll see you guys in two weeks. Thank you for being here.